World Combat Sports. What's going on, everyone? And thanks for tuning in once again. You know what it is. It's Catchweight Episode 716. And we're going to talk some boxing today. We got a lot to talk about. It's a lot that's in the headlines, as always. You know, it may have been COVID-19. But since boxing is taken um, back to the ring, you know, the um, talk is picking up. The media is, is um, you know, gaining traction a little bit. Even though the fight cards have been a bit light, still, it's enough to talk about. And we're definitely going to talk about Josh, <laughs> Joshua Franco, man, upsetting Andrew Maloney, y'all. Come on. What's up? What's up? What's up? Hey, appreciate everybody who's uh, who dropped through, man. I dropped the link in the live chat for anybody who will, who have some comments and want to jump on and talk about you know the recent events of boxing and top rank cards. We have another one that's um, coming up tomorrow. Hey, I dropped the whole main card in the description se section for those of you that's tuning in to World Combat Sports. Hey, let's talk about the, um, the previous fight card. You know, Miguel Contreras. I got to start off with Miguel Contreras, man. He stepped in there with the fighter. Miguel Contreras only had like five more fights experience-wise, you know, than his opponent. And um, you can see right away that it was going to be an issue from the first round. And the reason why I say that, man, the way he was, how active he was, you know, I don't know if he, he, he was in there to try to, I don't know. Hold up. I don't know if he was trying to bully his opponent early, but what he was able to do was just absolutely take control of a dumb and um, undefeated fighter who stepped in there at five and zero. Oh. You know what I'm saying? He said, okay, I put my five and zero oh record against your 10 and zero oh record. And um, once the fifth round was on deck, people was like, maybe this kid bit off a little bit more than he can chew. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I didn't think that way. Let me, let me pull this up right quick. So um, Contreras, in my opinion, man, looked like the more sharper fighter. He looked like the stronger fighter. And definitely he was the much quicker fighter. But I'm not saying uh, Rolando Vargas was anything less. He tried. You know, I got to give it up. A lot of people are criticizing his team for basically putting him in there, um, overmatching him with the, with the fighter that, had, that was 10-0 stepping into their, that, that ring. Well, 11-0 um, stepping in there, right? And um, 
it just comes down to man taking risk. It, it you know, I've I've seen other fighters that had single digit wins stepping out against a fighter who had um, double digit wins on their record, had way more experience. And the only thing it did for them is prove that how good they truly is, who how how good they was planning on being. And Vargas, man, he was outmatched. Absolutely, he was outmatched. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie to you. Even though he went to a decision, um, he was outmatched when it came down to boxing technique and overall boxing skill set. <clears throat> Hold on for a second. I see H Money. Um. Yeah, what's H-Money, up, bro? What's good, man? How you feeling? I'm I'm good, man. How you, man? I'm good. I'm good. It was a great night of boxing last night. Joshua Franco, like you said, man, got the upset victory. He he got that fight on short notice. What was your your thoughts on that fight? Man, you know, Joshua Franco was saying all along that he felt that he had what it take to go in there and expose, you know, um, Andrew Maloney for who he was. Andrew Maloney was sitting at what? He was he was like 21 and 0, wasn't he? Yes, 21 so, and 0. He came in 21 and 0 and 17 knockouts, man. Like, that's respectable, bro. Yes, the uh, world champion undefeated. And Joshua Franco, he he took that fight on short notice as well. You know, um, he got that fight at the last minute because uh I believe it was a traveling ban or um, you know, uh, for the uh, the first opponent. So, you know, he came from the zone. He actually, yeah. you know, got that call from uh from top rank and he took the opportunity and became a champion hey do you think um you know maloney having his first fight in the u.s do you think it was something that he wasn't used to coming in here with no crowd you know none of that i know boxers go into sparring all the time but do you think it affected him coming over here to the u.s for the first time facing somebody like franco no i don't think so because um you know during the telecast um the espn announcers they were saying how um he wanted to come to America. That's something that he wanted to do. They said he wanted to come to America and fight in America. And, uh, man, he just – he ran into a beast last night. Oh, he was a beast, man. I ain't going to lie. You know he, he, he you know he was cornered by Robert Garcia, so you know he was bringing the pain already, man. For sure, for sure. So what was the uh, original topic you was talking about before I came through? I heard you said Vargas. So which Vargas were you talking about? I just enjoyed the fight with Miguel Contreras, man, and Rolando Vargas. Real talk. Um, Miguel Contreras was 11-0. And, 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 and when I saw that fight initially, I said, oh, we got a young hitter that's stepping up to the plate and taking the risk and coming here and fighting somebody that's much more experienced. I mean, I like that. But he was outworked. By the time the fifth or sixth round rolled around, they was like, um, maybe his team matched him up with the fighter that that's um more technically skilled than he is you're right you're right that was a battle of the undefeated yesterday too because yeah. uh, vargas was five and oh with five knockouts and Contreras, i believe was 11 and oh and it was a good fight you know um and um i just think that Contreras had you know more skills in his toolbox he he was able to you know outbox him you know and and vargas was trying to look for that big shot vargas has skills too so we don't want to um yeah, he had a lot of skills, but he, he got that cut, I think, around number two over his eye. And um, he, his nose was bleeding. And I think, man, the blood was getting into his eye. And, man, I don't I don't know if he had that experience. The Vargas was only 20 years old. He was only 20. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he was a young fighter. I think he can bounce back. You know what I mean? I think he can bounce back. But that was a really good fight. You're right about that. Yeah, he can bounce back, man. He's not the first fighter that stepped in there and took a um, loss that early in his career. But also, I got to look at his corner. Whoever matched him up believed in him, you know, enough to to, to sign him on to face Miguel Contreras, who has film out there. They know he was going to be a tough opponent. And Contreras went in there and, and basically outworked and outperformed Vargas the entire fight. Yeah, that that was a great fight. You know what I mean? That possibly a, you know future world champion in Miguel Contreras he he showed us a lot of skills he showed us a lot of skills he was very fast too I think his speed was the difference in that fight and he was yeah. able to make adjustments I agree 
So what you think about, you know, Jason Maloney at the Bantamweight division coming in here, you know, he up there against Leonardo Baez, right? Um, you know, he already has one loss, but it's no loss that you can scoff at. You know, you can't frown upon him because he lost to a, a world champion, Emmanuel Rodriguez at the, at the time. So he took one loss, but he's coming in here. He's supposed to have been the previous opponent of Joshua Greer Jr., you know, who, who just lost um, on his card. So how how do you how do you see him coming in here, man? You know, after seeing his brother take that loss. Yeah, that's tough. He was at the fight yesterday, and he, he witnessed his brother take his first loss. Uh, you know, Andrew Maloney was undefeated, and uh, I feel like um, you know uh, Jason Jason Maloney. You know, he's gonna probably try to avenge the defeat of his brother. I think he's gonna come out, you know, and and look strong. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you you never know. You never know in the sport of boxing. Yeah, you never know. Plus, there's no crowd there. And from what I'm hearing over there in Vegas, man, they're real strict. You know, they have the fighters in a bubble, so to speak. Um, they're testing. As you probably already heard, you know, Jamel Herring, he tested positive for COVID-19. So just when I think COVID-19 is fake, you know, Jamel Herring still up here and test positive. And then you had the whole Dre Jose Pedraza situation where one of his team members, uh, somebody around there tested positive, so that pulled that card, you know. So I don't know. I, it, it should be a pretty decent fight, man. These fight cards are light, but the main event, co-main event, is okay. Okay. Um, and yesterday was some great fights. You know what I mean? Um, I'm hoping that tomorrow will be some good fights. I think Maloney probably come out look strong. So who is the better of the two brothers, J Jason or Andrew? Well, I would say if his brother, you know, um, Andrew Maloney was 21 and 0, of course, he was holding the belt. I would consider him the better fighter. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, you have to look at his brother, Jason Maloney, stepping in there against Emmanuel Rodriguez. And I have to say to myself, you know, that's that's quality opposition right there. You stepped up to the plate to face, you know, Emmanuel Rodriguez, who, who moved up already. Hey, it's, it's, it's hard to say, man, but um, I would have to go with um, Andrew Maloney, in my opinion. Okay. Man, he has more knockouts, Tony. You know, he's 20, he's 20, he's he's 21 and one right now. Um, 17 knockouts, I believe. So he went in there against a fighter who only had eight knockouts and um, Joshua Franco. So I don't know, man. I, I, I would look at Andrew Maloney as being the better brother. For sure, for sure. You know, um, I hope uh, I hope Jamel Heron makes a speedy recovery. You know, he's a, a ex, I believe, an ex Marine. You know, served this country. He was, uh, he's a world champion. And the, yeah, my brother, that COVID nineteen is real, brother. It, it's oh, it's really? really okay. Yeah, it's real, brother. My my aunt had it. She had it like oh. when it first. Yeah, when it first came out, she had it. You know, in Los Angeles, she worked at the airport, so. She, I believe she caught it while she was at work mm. and, uh, you know, she was in some ser serious, you know, conditions, but she beat it. You know, thank God she beat it. God is, God is the greatest. And um, I'm happy that my aunt beat it, but it's real. You know what I mean? And, and I hope Jamel Heron makes a speedy recovery. You know, from what I'm seeing from that interview last night, it looked like he was doing okay though. He didn't, he didn't really look like he had uh, many uh, symptoms, you know? So yes, man, it's just, it's tough, man. You know what I mean? Do, do you think that they um they brought boxing back too quick? Did they open up the country too fast? You know, um, first of all, I want to say, yeah, I, I wish my brother in arms also, Jamel here in the speedy recovery. I already said this before, but um, also to, to your aunt, I believe, you know, it's good that she was able to recover also. Um, I, I, don't, don't take too much seriousness, seriousness in what I'm saying about COVID-19 being fake, you know? I myself, I just look at it as being, it seems like some people were diagnosed with COVID-19 that didn't have it. And then some that had it, you know, legitimate was, was diagnosed with it and they got treated and, and a lot of them died. I don't know which ones died from COVID-19 that actually had it and the ones that died that didn't have it, you know, but it, 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 it all depends, man. Um, What was your question again, bro? Hmm. What was my question? I might have forgotten. You, you oh, asked me. Um, 
what 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 um what did you ask me I, f- I forgot what you asked me man but um yeah i hope jamel heron is able to return man and get back into the groove and everything and oh yeah i got it i'm oh. sorry i remember the question did they you know bring boxing back too quick and was uh do you think that we open up the country too fast in america well the country wasn't opening open initially all together it's just not, not like it was a single gateway and they said okay everybody cool they start opening shit up region at a time state at a time right so now in georgia you know of course they was one of the first to open up the open up the floodgates man to small businesses to get back running um do i believe it was too quick i don't i don't believe so because if they still would have been shut down it would have been a lot of businesses down here that would have um, basically um, just destroyed out of a, our economy down here in Georgia. It would have messed us up bad. So I don't believe they brought boxing back. You know why? I'm looking at the number of cases that are being generated per fight card, and the cases of COVID-19 positive are very low at the time. That's even with um, mixed martial arts. Yeah, that's true. That's true, my brother. You know what I mean? I just, man, I mean, it, that COVID-19 is is crazy. You know what I mean? And it's, it seems like it's still spreading. And you know what I mean? It's been over about four months now, you know, since it came. Well, since it was really uh, spreading, you know, in America like this. And it's, it's been a long time, brother. You know what I mean? And we, we may just want to go back to normal. I don't know if we will ever go back to the way it was. I totally agree, man. And I, I can see you take it more serious than I do. I'm going to be honest because you actually knew somebody. I, I, I haven't known not a single person. I, I haven't known. The first person I can actually say, okay, I, I actually know, is only the boxers that, you know, that's out here or the MMA fighters. Personally, I, I don't know anybody who has COVID-19. So, you know, respect, you know, respect to you know you having somebody who's recovered to it you know not to make light of it but um it's a bad deal man because people got to work you have a lot of people who went broke you, you have a lot of people who business crashed a lot of people who business was looted you know because all the stuff that's been going on hey shout out to um sb90 in the live chat um i want to transition over his question which it's going to be a good topic. I don't know if you heard it there, um, H Money, but he said, what do you guys think of Maurice Lee interview today? He had an interview with the Boxing Voice. And I'm not sure you tuned in to it, but you know what I'm talking about? You know who Maurice Lee is? Yes, Maurice Lee. He's rumored to be fighting Earl Spence, I believe, September 19th. I seen. I think they made an, an announcement on that. And the only, um, hey, the only rumor is from his talk, from his mouthpiece only, man. Nobody else has really confirmed that he's facing Errol Spence. Yeah, that's a that's a good topic right there. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Because um, we all know that Errol Spence Jr. He was in that car wreck. He almost lost his life. You know, he suffered some injuries, and um, you know, he hasn't been in the ring for a while. And also, you know, he hasn't been cleared to spar. If I'm not mistaken, he hasn't been cleared to spar. And um, do you feel like Errol Spence deserves a tune up? You know what I mean? In Maurice Lee rather than the Danny Garcia fight. You know what I mean? What's your thoughts on that situation? Man, solid question. When it comes to Errol Spence, right, coming off that, man, superb performance against Sean Porter. Obviously the best performance in his entire career, right? And like you said, he did have a horrific car accident. But Errol Spence said out of his mouth, right? He said he didn't want to come back and have a soft touch. Is Maurice Lee comparable to the competition that he just faced is Maurice Lee considered a soft touch. Yes, absolutely. Have we heard Errol Spence is coming back to face Danny Garcia? Yes, we've heard that. So I'm just, I'm just on board to believe like, I got to believe the Danny Garcia fight. You know what I'm saying? Um, on the level of Danny Garcia stepping in there with Sean Porter, Sean Porter stepping in there with Errol Spence and losing, but yet Danny Garcia still has a credible name. He still has a resume. He's still one of the top welterweight fighters in the game. To Maurice Lee, it's a lot of what he was saying today, bro. I just thought it was trolling. You know, he was like saying, hey, man, you know, um, 
you know, he's all about his 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 God, his Christianity. His team is going to be wearing all white. Um, dude was really having an answer for everything. He said, hey, I signed a contract. So Ness, shout out to the boxing voice. Um, Ness asked him, so how is this? You know, what what do we have to, to lean on here? What what is it going to be like? How can you confirm it? And he was like, oh, the contract signed. He said, so who informed you? He said, Al Heyman. <laughs> I was like, Al Heyman. OK, Al Heyman. OK. And then he said, well, you know, he kept talking to him. And then Maurice Lee say something like 10 million. He's getting 10 million for the fight right there. I said to myself, man, this dude is on something real nice. Some bath salts, some goddamn K2, some Flocka. He's on something that's real strong, man. What you think, bro? Um, Yeah, that's, you know, I feel like, see, that, that Earl Spence car accident, I think it was more serious than, you know, that we really think. And um, Earl Spence, I feel like he's a fighter. You know, and yeah. he wants to fight. He wants to fight the best. So, if you know, somebody asks him, He's going he's going to say, you know, he wants to fight a Terrence Crawford. He wants to fight a, a Manny Pacquiao. He wants to fight Danny Garcia. He's going to say that because he's a fighter. And, you know, he that's that's the nature of a fighter. They love to fight and they want to fight the best. But, yeah. you know, is he really, you know, fully, you know, recovered? That's why in my, you know, in my you know opinion, I would like to see him take a tune up fight just to see where he's at. You know, even. Terrence Crawford said it himself. He said, you know, I wouldn't fight Earl Spence right now. He even said, I wouldn't fight him right now after that accident. He said he wants to see exactly where he's at, you know, um, because if he fights him and he beats him right now, he won't get the credit that he deserves after that accident. So I just feel like, you know, if any time that Earl Spence did deserve, deserve a tune-up, you know, it would be after that accident. He never had a, you know, a tune-up before. He never asked for one, and he, he's not asking for – for one right now, but I just feel like the matchmakers, you know, that's why we have matchmakers in the sport of boxing. And I just feel like, man, I just want to see where he's at after that accident, just to be real. I feel you, man. Um, Carlos Ocampo was a tune up. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Carlos Ocampo, he knocked him out in the first round, man. Um, you don't think Danny Garcia is a tune up? No, no, Danny's <laughs> not a tune up. Danny's a, a former champion, a welterweight champion. Danny, he only lost to champions. He don't, he's only lost to Sean Porter and um Keith Thurman in, in close fights, you know. And I agree, and Danny I mean, I agree with you. Hey, I, I, I agree. Uh, you know, I agree. I, I, I was just asking the question because, in Errol Spence's mind, ticket wise and everything else, or whatever the case, he may think Danny Garcia is a tune up. Yeah, he might, you know, he just. He's very confident in himself. You know, he's very confident. And, um, you know, I just feel like my brother, you know, at the time, you know, we come, we just coming back to boxing. Earl is just starting to recover. I don't think there's going to be any fans at that fight. You know what I mean? If, the, you know, when he does return. And, um, you know, we, I just want to see Earl back in the ring. I'm, You know, I don't mind, you know, if it's Danny or, or Maurice Lee, but... I just feel like, you know, I just want to see as an Earl Spence fan, you know what I mean? I just want to see him in there, take a, a tune-up fight so we can make sure that he recovered all the way. You know what I mean? Because, yeah, man, that was a serious accident. He took some some um, facial damage. You know, his teeth got knocked out, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah. he, he took some, some damage to the face. You know what I mean? We don't know how severe it really was. So that's why I feel like. Earl, Earl needs to take a tune-up. And Danny Garcia, like I said, Danny, he's an elite fighter. He's still in his prime. Danny been in there with Thurman, Sean Porter, Lucas Matisse. He beat, you know, Lamont Peterson. He beat fighters like um, like uh, Robert Guerrero. And um, Danny Garcia has never been knocked out before. He's never been knocked out. He's still, he's still very a very good fighter. So, yeah, man, I just don't want to see Earl come back. You know what I mean? And take, you know, a tough fight. You know, and he hasn't recovered all the way. That's all. I mean, I hear what you're saying, my brother, for real. I, I hear what you're saying about Errol Spence. But, you know, Errol Spence knows how he feels. And, yeah, we can say it's a near-death experience by the by the look of it and him being ejected. But he didn't have on the seatbelt. And we really don't know all the injuries. We just know 
he, he, he landed on his face, on his side, knocked out some teeth, but we don't know anything else. But like you said earlier, Errol Spence at the time hasn't been cleared to spar because he was getting teeth implants and he had to wait for the bone or whatever to heal so he can get his permanent teeth to start sparring. You know with boxing, bro, you know we don't really know the true calendar on when these fighters return. We don't know. You know, I mean, er Errol Spence can already be sparring already, but he don't come to the media a lot. The most we ever heard Errol Spence talk is when he came on the podcast, All the Spoke. You know what I'm saying? That's the first time we really heard him explain the entire situation, you know? So um, unless Errol Spence come back out here and we find a little bit more, we don't know what to think. But to Maurice Smith, I mean, Maurice Lee, um, the guy was hilarious, man. I couldn't take him serious because one minute he's talking about Christianity the next minute, he's saying that he's definitely going to fight Errol Spence. So the first time he came out, he would say, hey, you know, bitch ass nigga, you better know who I am. You know, you're going to know who I am if you don't know. So I'm, I'm saying to myself, like, this dude is out there in Vegas, isn't he? He's out there in Vegas, right, Maurice Lee? Yeah, he, he trains with uh, the Floyd Mayweather, uh, the money team. He's with TMT. I haven't heard anybody. I haven't heard Lena LB. I haven't heard anybody vouch for this dude. I haven't heard anybody co-sign for this dude. But yet they allowing him to go on the boxing voice. This is the second time we heard him speak. The first time he was just, you know, on his on his phone or whatever. But this interview today, man, he was talking a lot of shit, bro. He's talking about they're, they're going to be at the radio sta um, radio sta stadium, and um, you know he's getting ten million for the fight. Ness was like. How you getting 10 million for the fight? Like, that's bold. You know, he said, um, with trusting God, anything happened. I, I mean, I can't I can't take this guy serious, bro. I can't do it. Yeah, he's a uh, I would say one thing, he's doing a good job of promoting himself, you know what I mean? Because we are Absolutely. talking about him, man. He's doing a good job. I want to give a quick shout out to my brother in the chat, TJ, TJ Thoughts. You know, that's that's my guy. I had uh, posted your video on my channel. And he came through. So shout out to TJ, man. That's a good brother right there. Subscribe to the channel, TJ. Thank you, bro. And um to you, TJ. Yeah, he's Appreciate doing a good, it, man. Bro, he's doing a good job promoting himself. He's talking a good game. And he's just making it interesting. You know, he keeps talking that type of trash. People going to want to see him get his butt whooped. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. People oh, going yeah. to want to <laughs> People oh, yeah. going to see him get his ass whooped. And uh you know um just to talk about um the Earl Spence accident one more time. You remember on that All the Smoke podcast with Matt Barnes and Steven Jackson, yeah. he also said that after that accident, he said he didn't he didn't remember anything that happened. He, he just remember waking up in the hospital. So the accident was pretty bad, bro, because he the man said he doesn't remember anything. He just remember waking up in the hospital. So, you know, what I mean, I just hope that he's OK all the way. You know, he make a, a full recovery. I love Earl Spence. He's a great fighter. You know what I mean? A great body puncher. Very aggressive. You know, he's future Hall of Famer in the sport of boxing. You know what I mean? And I'm happy that he's making a full recovery. You know what I mean? I'm happy that he's making a full recovery. But Maurice Lee, he's he really selling himself really good right now. Hey, for sure, man. And um, appreciate TJ um, subscribing to the channel, man. Appreciate that. Um, let, me, let me tell you something about the blackouts from somebody who actually know, right? And... Um, I'm, I'm going to keep it simple, Age Money. I'm, I'm going to put it like this. I had I, I was real big in the motorcycles, right? Running motorcycles, right? So um, it was one time where, you know, I had my, my my family. We was going to a game, and my family was driving on the side of me. So I was doing a stand-up willy, you know, for my son and everything. And the, and the wife was there driving beside, so I was showing out a little bit. So I came down, and the speed, you know, the speed was a little bit more than what I wanted it to be once I brought the bike down. So when I went into the corner, and that's one of my specialties. I love dragging corners or whatever. It was a white truck out there. And I told this story before. Now, all I saw was the white truck, and I, and I grabbed the brakes. I, gro I grabbed all of them, the rear, the front, everything. I crashed my bike. It wasn't into the truck, but it was into the curve or whatever. That's the last thing I remember. I saw a bright light. I was knocked unconscious, and then I started coming to. 
I don't remember anything else that happened. Like it was no white truck there. It was nothing. I mean, I had a helmet on, blacked out. I actually saw the, saw the white light, man. I did. I mean, I'm not making this shit up. I saw it. So when I hear when I saw, when I heard Errol Spence say he didn't remember shit, I'm saying to myself, I totally understand on that night he didn't remember stuff on that night, but I'm sure Errol Spence remembered things before the accident that took place. Because the only thing I can say when you black out from adrenaline and everything else, yeah, you can you can have short term memory loss at that moment. That's real talk because I don't remember anything that happened before I had the accident and when I actually came to. I can't remember anything. Hey, man, th thank God, man. You know, you survived that accident. We've seen, you know, fighters in the past die from accidents like Diego Corrales. Rest in peace to Diego Corrales. You know what I mean? Who who died from a, a motorcycle accident. Also, we've seen, you know, um, Paul Williams, Paul Williams. get paralyzed. Yeah, paralyzed from, you know, from the neck down, you know, after his motorcycle accident. You know what I mean? So, yeah, man, it's serious. It's really serious, bro. You know what I mean? Got to be careful out here. You know what I mean? I don't like motorcycles, to be honest. I don't like, uh, you know, I don't like bungee jumping or anything like wild like that. You know what I mean? I feel like life is, man, life is precious, man. Now, I want to, I really don't try to take no chances like that. Ace money, man, you gotta take a risk, bro. You gotta go repel him. You gotta you gotta you gotta go to a high place and jump off, man, and find out what's what life is really about when you black out, you know, saying and go to a whole nother mental dimension. You gotta you gotta do it, man. You gotta live, you know, on the edge. Now, I'm talking about stuff that you can control. I'm not talking about stuff like riding high speeds on a um motorcycle or vehicle, or whatever that case may be. You know what I'm saying? But um, back to Errol Spence, man, the only thing I can say about Errol Spence is that he sent out a text a little ways after the accident. He said, no broken bones. I'm a savage. That, to me, say he's in good mental. I don't know if it's somebody on his team, but I'm saying to myself, Errol Spence, it came from him, uh, his phone or whatever. He said, no broken bones. I'm a savage. And then he took it down. Yeah, I, I remember that. I remember that. You know, there's no telling if, if it was somebody on his team that did it because, uh, you know, I don't think Earl was in that uh, the, the right state of mind around that time, you know, to uh, to really do anything like that. I'm not sure, to be honest. I'm not sure. But, uh, yeah, he just was being – if it was him, I feel like he was just, you know, showing that he was okay. You know what I mean? It's letting his fans know that everything is – you know, everything is okay, and he survived it, you know. But, yeah, man, that, that was a crazy accident, bro. You know what I mean? But the, from the, the benefits I see and, the you know, I, I see some good things that came out of this situation because Earl Spence on that same podcast, he said that um now, you know, he lost 15 pounds during quarantine. He's rededicated to the sport. And, you know, he's talking about how in between that Sean Porter fight, he was at 185 pounds, 85. Yeah. 180, yeah. So he was, you know, in a way he was, he lost that discipline that made him a great fighter. And I feel like now Earl Spence, you know, has a second chance at life. Earl Spence is, is um, you know, Earl Spence is rededicated to the sport of boxing. And um, I look at it like a blessing, a blessing in disguise. And now, you know what I'm saying? This is that the Earl Spence that we, we, we grew to love that same Earl Spence that Keith Thurman was ducking for years that Keith Thurman was avoiding. And now Earl Spence is rededicated to the sport. And I've seen his face, man. He looks, he looks good, bro. He looks, he looks healthy. His face look really clear. And I just like that. I like, you know, that this is the Earl Spence that we first met. You know what I mean? That's what I see. Let me ask you this, man. You think Earl Spence a great fighter? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He's a great fighter. He's a very. So you said you said Errol Spence was a future Hall of Famer. Like Errol Spence has only became champion, even though he's a WBC and the IBF champion in one division. Even though he competed at one fifty four, and then he dropped down the welterweight. Does he have something else to prove, man? You know, to be considered one of the greats to ever do it. Because right now, in my opinion, I don't. I don't think so. Well, okay. Um. 
to be honest, I feel like Earl Spence, he became a champion around 26, I believe 27, because everybody was avoiding him. You know what I mean? Those fighters were avoiding him. The Keith Thurman's, he didn't want to fight Earl Spence. He was freezing him out for a very, very long time. So Earl Spence, he got his first title shot against Kell Brook. He Correct. fought Kell Brook, Kell Brook, um, who, you know what I'm saying, was the IBF champion at the time, who just took a loss to Triple, Triple G, G. Kell Brook. Kell Brook, remember, he beat Sean Porter. Kell Brook is the first man Correct. to beat Sean Porter. Earl Correct. Spence, he beat he beat Sean Porter, Kell Brook, Mikey Garcia, too. Mikey Garcia, who's considered a top 10 fighter in the world, pound for pound, you know, pound for pound, top 10 fighter. Earl Spence dominated Mikey Garcia for 12 rounds. He won every every round in that fight, and he made it look easy. You know, Earl Spence is possibly one of the most avoided fighters in boxing for the um, – you know, of this generation, he was avoided by um, Keith Thurman. He was avoided by fighters like Manny Pacquiao. Manny Pacquiao, you know, hopped in the ring after the Mikey Garcia fight, got in the ring, and Earl Spence was like, let's make it happen, Manny. Let's make it happen. And Manny didn't want the fight. Manny took the Keith Thurman fight when we all wanted to see Manny versus Spence. So I feel like Earl Spence has been getting avoided. And there's a lot of fighters in the past, my brother, that were great fighters that was avoided for a, lo a long time. Fighters like Winky Wright was avoided. You know what I mean? People were were ducking Winky. And I, I kind of, you know, compare Earl Spence to Winky Wright in a way, you know what I mean, with his high guard defense, both of them southpaws. I love Spence, though, bro. Like, he can't, you know, he he wasn't able to get Keith, Keith Thurman in the ring because Keith was avoided in that fight for years, saying, oh, Earl Spence needs to become a champion first. Then I'll fight him. Let him get a belt. Earl Spence got the belt. Keith Thurman, you know what I mean? He, he still didn't want to fight. You know what I mean? So that's yeah, how yeah, I, yeah. I love it. You're right. Hey, but check this out, though. You consider Kell Brook great? Kell was on his way to be. He, I wouldn't say he just great that's a no, like right? that. But yes or no, right? That's a no, right? Um, no. That's so, a tough so. one because Kell Brook beat Porter. You remember he beat Check Porter? this out, though. Kell Brook did beat Porter. But was Porter great when Kell Brook beat him? Now, if you're gonna link up, if you're gonna link up Arrow Spence, Arrow Spence to Kell Brook, the Kell Brook who was the first one to defeat Sean Porter, right? The the one who went up and wait to defeat um, Triple um, to go in there and, and attempt to contend against Triple G, came back down and fought Arrow Spence, right? Now, within the equation of of Kell Brook, and you comparing him to Arrow Spence. As being a great fighter, you have to have somebody on your resume that makes you great. You your your body of work have to identify you being a great fighter. So Kale Brook, you know well as I do, Kale Brook is isn't a great fighter. Even though Sean Porter did step in there with Keith Thurman, you know Sean Porter did step in there with Kale Brook, but when Kale Brook stepped in there against um, Errol Spence, yes, he was ahead on the fight, but he ended up being stopped. OK, who else can you say outside of Sean Porter all right, and Kell Brook, who people don't consider great fighters? Who else can boost up Errol Spence resume? Who can boost up his freaking body of work? You know, to say that Errol Spence is a great, great fighter right now. Who can you who can you name? Uh, Mikey Garcia. Now, look, Mikey, Mikey Garcia, okay, I get where you're going with that because he's a four-division champion and he moved up in weight after getting the belt from Sergey Lipinets at junior welterweight, right? So he decided to move up the, up the welterweight. I get it. But I don't think he was a true welterweight at the time. But I understand what you're saying, though. I understand that him being a four-division champion, future Hall of Famer, don't you think Errol Spence have to get another, another belt at a different division and beat somebody with the name to be considered great. Yeah, in due time, you know the the big money fights are at 147. The fight that we all want to see is Earl Spence versus Manny Pacquiao. We want to see Earl Spence versus Terence Crawford. You know what I mean? Undisputed. He he wants to clean out his division and the welterweight division. We know is the one of the hottest divisions in boxing. You got heavyweight, absolutely, and you get you got welterweight. So the big money fights are at welterweight. If it wasn't. If it wasn't big fights at 147, he would have moved up to 154 already. You know what I mean? But he he needs that Manny Pacquiao fight. He needs that Terrence Crawford fight. So, you know, just 
you know, just to talk about that um, Mikey Garcia win real quick. You know, Mikey Garcia came up from 135. If I'm not mistaken, he, he beat yeah. Adrian Broner at 140. He beat yeah. Lippinets. And Terrence Crawford also came up from 135. You know, Correct. Crawford C Crawford wasn't – he's not a, an original welterweight. He's not a true welterweight. So, you know what I mean? Will that and take Crawford, away from – Crawford um, is a Hall of Famer before Errol Spence. I respect, I respect, you know, um, your opinion. You don't, but you who don't did think Crawford beat? Okay. I like Crawford. Who, but who did, who was those fighters that he beat at for Undisputed? He beat Thomas Delorme for a vacant WBO world title. It he beat matter. Victor Postal. Well, I'm, I'm just saying, he beat, Correct. he beat Victor Postal and then he beat, um, Indongo. So I feel like who, who was the great fighters that, um, Terrence Crawford beat to put him in a Hall of Fame? The best fighters, like I mentioned, uh, Kel Brook, Sean Porter, and uh, Mikey Garcia for Earl. So, but, for see, Crawford, but see, who, none who of those forgot? fighters that you're you're matching up, none of those fighters that you match up with Errol Spence are great fighters. Mikey, it's tough, Mikey it's was tough to say, it's, a, it's tough to say. I would say if somebody, if I earn the three division championship, I was a champion in three divisions, undisputed at one forty. My career supersedes that of Errol Spence, who is only the WBC and IBF champion, bro. Because you can't take Kell Brook. I know what you I know what you're saying. You're saying, okay, when it comes to the quality of champions, I look at Kell Brook, I look at Sean Porter, who people respect like like I don't know what. And then I look at um you know uh you just compare all those those fighters together the garcia who in my opinion wasn't a true welterweight but he's a four division champion now if you was to say errol spence go over there and fight manny pacquiao who's in a class of his own and then he go in there and defeat terence crawford my attitude changes my narrative changes bro i'm saying shit errol spence he's a freaking um undisputed champion man since zab judah you know facts I have Facts. to, I have to right, give bro. him his nod, bro. I have to give him his salute. I say, okay, H Money, I, I get it. You know, Errol Spence is one of the best to do it because he was able to unify the um, welterweight division. And with that, he was able to defeat Kell Brook, Mikey Garcia, Sean Porter, Terrence Crawford, you know what I'm saying, Manny Pacquiao, Mikey Garcia. The shit changes then. Whole different narrative, bro. Okay, I just – I want to know from you – um. So Terrence Crawford, he's a good fighter. I'm not uh, saying anything bad about Crawford. I like Crawford, but who are the, those big wins, the biggest wins on his resume to put him in the Hall of Fame? You know, not not just saying, you know, he undisputed, but who was the big wins? Like, give me three wins. I gave you three wins from um from Earl Spence. You know what I mean? So give me the three big wins on Crawford resume, and we can compare them to Spence. I can't really go off the names. Of, of, of Terrence Crawford. The reason why I just can't go off the names because you have to get in where you fit in when you out here building up your resume. You know about boxing, man. You know when you're building up your resume. If you look at the little lower basement part where a fighter is just starting off and you got some non-winning records on there, you got some people who have 12 losses and all that. So as they start to build their they record up, right? Then you look at how many undefeated fighters they fought. I think Terrence Crawford may have had around five or six undefeated fighters on his record, right? Now, to answer your question, the names, I can't really validate the names on Terrence Crawford because you named them. Julius Ndongo, is he a great fighter? No, no one's going to say he's a great fighter. You know what I'm saying? They're not going to give you that. They're not going to give Terrence Crawford that credit. They're not going to give Jeff Horn the credit, Joseph Benavidez. They're not going to give him the credit. You know what I'm saying? So only thing I'm doing is the quantification of divisions. He's a three division champion and former undisputed. And you know why I say he's going to be in the Hall of Fame before? Because there's other people in the Hall of Fame that has less divisions than himself. They have less divisions of championships than um, Terrence Crawford and they in the they in the Hall of Fame. For sure. See, like Mikey, you said Mikey's a four division world champion. That's more than Crawford. And Correct. Adrian Broner's a four division world champion. You know what I Correct. mean? But it, it just feel like 
who did Broner beat for those belts? We we can't even name three of the fighters that he beat for the belt. So hey, it's like talking about AB, I agree, bro. I agree. I agree. Yeah, but I like Crawford. I think AB Crawford to beat the, the champ. Yeah. I think Crawford to beat all those guys. Like he'll beat a Broner, of course. I think he'll beat a Mikey. But I, I like Crawford. You know what I mean? I just, you know, I want to see Crawford in there with some of those top. I, I want to see a Hall of Famer, potential Hall of Famer on the resume of Terrence Crawford. I feel like his best wins was a Gamboa. Uh, he beat Gamboa, Victor Postal. I would say a Victor Postal, Gamboa, and uh, who was the other guy he beat at welterweight? It was another guy, Americon probably. Americon, uh, Vic, Victor Postal, and Gamboa. I would say th those are his three best victories. You know what I mean? But I don't, I don't see a potential Hall of Famer on that resume. And Gamboa was undefeated at the time that Crawford beat him. That's when Gamboa he, he was, was coming off a year. He was coming off a year and a half hiatus too. Yes, you're right. You're right. Any book, I think he tested positive for a banned substance. And around that time, he was out the ring for a year and a half. But, you yeah. know, he was actually beat, beating Crawford for most of the, the beginning of the fight. In the beginning of the fight, he was getting off first. He hurt Crawford too with a big shot. But I like Crawford. You know what I mean? I do. Crawford got a lot of heart. I like him a whole lot, to be honest. I I want to see the big fights. And Thurman, you know, uh, Earl Spence was robbed from that Thurman fight. Thurman avoided him. You know what I mean? Thurman ducked him. So Earl Spence wanted to fight the best, my brother. Hey, I, I never, you never heard me say I disagree with, with, with that aspect of what you were saying about Earl Spence being ducked by Keith Thurman. I never disagreed with that. Only thing I had um, a, a type of resistance to was, comparing Errol Spence as a great fighter. And, and look, it's nothing, you have your opinion. You know, it's boxing, man. We ain't gonna never agree. But a boxing dialogue is, is what's conducive to me. You know what I'm saying? And that's what you got going on. I'm just looking at Errol Spence, right? And I'm trying to compare him, even Mikey Garcia. Did Mikey Garcia ever become undisputed and won his divisions? No. So Mikey Garcia has one more division than Terrence Crawford. With no undisputed, why wouldn't Terrence Crawford get in the Hall of Fame and Mikey Garcia does? The body of work or the divisions? Amount of belts they had. That's a good question. That's a good question. You know, it's Mikey really got like some no good criteria. Like the criteria is like so complex when it comes to who gets in the boxing hall of fame. You know what I'm saying? It's 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 different, bro. Like People who you think don't deserve to get in the Hall of Fame, well, they get out here and start doing, you know, humanitarian and philanthropy and, and doing these tours. And then all of a sudden they're in the Hall of Fame. And you like, what did they do to get in the Hall of Fame? You know, so. I got a question for you. Um, So Undisputed, um, you know, I feel like Undisputed at one point was the biggest achievement in boxing, you know, wiping out your division. So yeah. this day and age. What's your thoughts on becoming undisputed? Like, okay, we, we talked about Crawford and the fighters that he beat to become undisputed. Uh, Julius and Dongo, Thomas Delorme, and Victor Postal. So um, do you think this day and age of becoming undisputed, like, I mean, how um, how do you uh, rank that? Like, do you think that's a great achievement hey, still, even if you – even if you beat like a bunch of guys that nobody heard of, like uh, Usyk, I love Usyk too. Usyk is a hey, great champion. I was about to go there. I was about to go there. Yeah, yeah. Usyk a great champion. I love his skills, and he, you know, at cruiserweight was undisputed. You know what I mean? So, what's your your thoughts on that? Because everybody says, oh, you know, um, Floyd Mayweather was never undisputed. Floyd May, or they say who else? They said it was Floyd Mayweather was never undisputed. It was a couple of other fighters. Manny Pacquiao was never undisputed. There's a lot of champions that they say. So um, what's your thoughts on that? You know what I mean? Hey, good question, man. Good question. Because, man, we, we had some, oh, man, we had some bushwhackers out there, man, trying to sit up here and always glorify Alexander Usyk for unifying the cruiserweight, knowing goddamn well no one pay attention to the cruiserweight division, man. So... To your question, man, when it comes to undisputed, I believe that is a jewel. That is a jewel to have to, to, to become undisputed, man. That's basically saying, you know, that's why people give Zab Judah his, his credit. You know, it's not a lot. You know, Zab Judah was in there with some big names. 
But one thing he has to his credit is that, you know, along with Terrence Crawford, like you said before, Terrence Crawford and the names are somewhat in a lot of people. They'll say, OK, they OK. Right. They're OK. But he was able to get it done. He stopped Julio Sandongo in three rounds. You know, Regis Prograce came behind him and did it in two. Still, Terrence Crawford did it before, and he was able to unify an entire division at 140. And I believe it holds a crown in glory when these fighters get ready to, to retire and go into the Hall of Fame. I mean, you look at look at on Lennox Lewis. Everybody always talk about him being the undisputed heavyweight champ. Everybody. But his two losses, he got knocked out flat. You know what I'm saying? He got knocked out cold, bro. So, um, you know, just put it this way. If I was going to say undisputed versus um, title defenses, which is a very tough comparison, I will have to go with the, with the undisputed up to a point. Because if you have somebody that's defending the title for like 10 years, you have to you have to factor that in to to the accolades they was able to achieve and who they fought to get there. But good question, man. I, I truly believe Undisputed is a diamond, man. It is a gem to have in your body of work as a fighter because not everybody can say they was an Undisputed champion. They collected everything. And also it depends on the era, too. It depends on what era you was Undisputed. For sure. Like, you know, um, I noticed like some some guys, you know what I mean, when they when they talk about fighters, you know, like Andre Ward, for example. Yeah, I, I asked a, a YouTuber once, man, Andre Ward, where do you rank him, you know, with the all-time greats? The first thing he said, Andre Ward was undisputed. I'm like, Andre Ward was under he was undefeated since he was 12 years old and an Olympic gold medalist. Andre Ward, one of the best fighters I've ever seen. You know what I mean? But they try to degrade him by saying he wasn't undisputed, though. You know what I mean? So, if all right, what you think about like comparing undisputed to fighting, um, fighting the best? Say you you weren't undisputed, but you fought the best, like a Floyd Mayweather. You fought, you know, the best, like Floyd Mayweather. You was never undisputed, but Floyd Mayweather, bro, was, I believe, a twenty-one time world champion. Floyd Mayweather fought everybody from Diego Corrales. Manny Pacquiao, Canelo's, Miguel Cotto, Shane Mosley, Oscar De La Hoya, Zab Judah. You could just name it. He beat everybody, but he never was undisputed. And I feel like I'd rather have those names, those defining victories, the legacy wins, the big names on my resume, the Hall of Famers, rather than an undisputed. What you think? See, when you factor that in to the accomplishments that Floyd Mayweather was able to achieve, it's a whole different narrative. It's a whole different narrative. You're talking about the body of work compared to just collecting the belt, a group of belts. Just like you said, man, okay, who did he beat to become undisputed? And then you factor in who Floyd Mayweather defeated to become fire division. I mean, come on, man. It, that's a no-brainer. The shit's going to weigh heavy on Floyd Mayweather. It's going to favor him, absolutely, because of the, amount, um, the body of work, the names on his resume, and – the amount of visions that he was able to achieve, how long he reigned as champion. You got to factor all that shit in. It totally convolutes freaking undisputed. Totally. For sure. That's, you know, those are just some of the thoughts that go on in my mind when I'm thinking about boxing and, you know, I'm just debating with myself, like, man, you know what I'm saying? Who, you know what I'm saying? Wh which is the best accomplishment. But I feel like during the eighties, like around that time, you know what I mean? Early nineties and things like that. The undisputed was important, like around the time that that um, I believe Marvin Hagler was undisputed. You know what I mean? Things of that nature. You know, I think it you know it meant a lot. But man, it's I not, appreciate the conversation. No H money, man, it, it's not important no more, bro. Undisputed isn't important no more unless you're in a higher division. Believe that, because check if it was important, Canelo would have tried to become undisputed, but it's not important. He vacated and he wanted to become franchise. Then you have the higher, the super middleweight and, and, and the light heavyweight. Who's trying to become undisputed? Every time it comes to that point, what happens? Either somebody move up and wait or they don't face a mandatory or whatever the case may be. So 
Canelo Alvarez and just say, for instance, for Silly Lomachenko. Compare these two. Two franchise champions, but look at look at how many belts that Vasily Lomachenko had. And what happened? He did the same thing Canelo did. He vacated the WBC and he became franchise champion. Undisputed didn't matter to them. But divisions, you know, Lomachenko is a three-division champion. You know, Canelo Alvarez, what he do? He move up the super middle, face Rocky Fielding, then move up and face Sergey Kovalov. It's all about divisions right now. You know why for Canelo? Because he's trying to be like Floyd Mayweather, the only loss on his record. Facts, facts. So um, I see that you got uh, Shakur Stevenson in the um, in the title. Um, what's going yeah. on with that situation with Shakur? And let me ask you a question, bro. I said this plenty of times. I believe Shakur Stevenson, who who who's the current featherweight champion, right? I believe Shakur Stevenson will be a multi division champion all the way up to welterweight when it's all said and done. What you think, man? Yeah, I agree. I agree. Shakur, man, he, he started to grow on me because at first I'm a, I'm a huge Devin Haney fan. Devin Haney is my favorite fighter, but you know, Shakur people were telling me, man, Shakur, too, Shakur, Shakur. So I watched Shakur fight this, uh, was it a couple of weeks ago? Man, that kid looked good. I'm yeah. like, yo, this kid is the real deal. Yeah, yeah. I think you, you're right about that. He will be. He will be a multi-division champion. I could see him moving up to, you know, possibly 147, 140 around there, you know, and he got the skills to pay the bills, that's for sure. So you like Shakur. I like Shakur, man. Um, having to be, you know, on deck with him, man, when he went to the Boiling Street Recreation Center. Shout out to those guys over there in Jersey, Brick City. You know, um, he was over there, you know, talking with the kids, him and Josh Greer Jr. at the time. The mayor dropped through and, you know, seeing Shakur Stevens and how he he has grown. You know, he had his, his incident in the street. You know, it happens in, in combat sports. I'm not condoning it, but fighters get in trouble all the time for domestic and criminal and fighting and all that shit. Right. But seeing him in the ring and the way he go in there and delegate his authority, man, is impressive. I like him. I like how he's sitting up here doing COVID-19 and say, you know what? When I return, I'm moving up to 130. He moves up to 130, goes in there and disperses a car barrio in six. Now he's like, I'm going to go up there and fight Miguel Burchette. Um, I'm, I'm going to go up here and fight this person. Oh, if it, me and Javante Davis a fight, I win. His language has a different temperature than Ryan Garcia. What, what you think, bro? I think his, his yeah, I told him on, on, on the way he call out fighters, his, his shit is different, man. Yeah, I totally agree, man. I'm I'm starting to love this kid, but Shakur Stevens. I'm starting to love him, man. He he got skills, bro. Well, like, what he did in his last fight, man, that kid dominated that fight. Like the dude, he the man he fought came out so aggressive in round number one. He put Shakur on the ropes, and yeah. Shakur instantly made his adjustments. Yeah. You know what I mean? Start using that footwork. And then he knocked him out, bro. Like, he was hitting him with the head shots. He was hitting him with the combinations to the head. But he realized, like, I'm not going to knock him out like that. He's so smart. Yeah. Had the yeah. presence of mind to go to the body and finished him. So True. his IQ is on a different level. His eye, his understanding of boxing is on a different level. I think Shakur Stevenson going to be a future Hall of Famer in the sport of boxing. You know, I think, man, and then you said he won Miguel Burchett. Burchett, bro, he's a monster. Now, Burchett is a monster. He's going to fight on Saturday, too. He's fighting yeah. this Saturday. He's a dog. And that's the – I think – I want to see that fight marinate a little bit. You know, I don't want to see him go straight into it. I want to see Shakur probably get one or two more fights. But I think that's the biggest fight at 130. That's going to be a big test for him right there. He even said, you know, he really wanted that Josh Warrington fight, bro. But, you know, it's, it's far from being – you know, the glue isn't there. You know, because Josh Warrington, you know, both of them has had banter, you know, verbal sparring back and forth in the media and shit. So that would be a good fight. You know, Josh Warrington and Shakur Stevenson. You know what I'm saying? But we don't know if that ha going to happen. But he's calling out some nice names, man, like Javante Davis. At, at, um, you know, he's current champion at 35, but he's dropping down to um, junior lightweight to face Leo Santa Cruz, supposedly. How you see that fight popping off, man? Javante and Leo Santa Cruz? Yeah, at 130. 
You think you think, think Devontae Devontae Smith, wait, wait, look, when he came down here to the A, he was he was an hour late or whatever to the weigh-ins. He came in a pound over. He shoved Gamboa. You know, it, it was mayhem in the weigh-ins. So <laughs> I, I, I'm like, is Javante gonna be able to 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 make 130, man? That's a great question. You know, Javante, he's a, had a history of missing weight. He, True. like you said, that his, he just moved up to 135 and he struggled making weight at 135. He missed weight. You know, he had to take have a two hour, uh, two hours to make weight. You know what I mean? So he missed weight a couple of times, got stripped for world titles. It's just a lack of dedication for Javante Davis, just to be honest. And he got the skills, he got the talent, but he doesn't have the discipline, you know. and you know, hopefully he can get it together. He's about 25 now. He's turning 26. You know, he's it's about time that he, you know, he, he gets on the right track. He needs to. He got Floyd Mayweather by his side. And um, I mean, he chose the wrong route. It's like he chose the Adrian Broner route, you know, the Adrian Broner approach. And is I don't I don't like that about him. And I think that's gonna be his um his downfall. I think that's gonna be his downfall. And um if Shakur Shakur calling out Javante. I believe they used to train with each other. They was um they were training with each other. They were friends. So it's kind of interesting that Shakur is calling them out. You know what I mean? And I think Shakur beat him. I just think Shakur got the skills to to outbox him. And he you know he got the cardio as well. But Javante can punch. I believe twenty three wins, twenty two knockouts, and uh, he got the power for sure. You know what I mean? But I just think. Shakur is going to make those adjustments to beat him. And as far as Javante Davis versus Leo Santa Cruz, I think Javante is too big for Leo Santa Cruz. I think Javante going to knock him. He's going to knock him out. You know what I mean? I, I, just, I just think that uh, Leo Santa Cruz has a lack of power. He has a lack of power, and he won't be able to keep uh, Javante Davis off of him. Man, solid analytics, man. Um, I, have to, I have to also weigh on the side of caution that – Javante Davis, definitely, you know, what you said as far as, you know, him being out here in the streets, falling behind Adrian Bronner, in some people's opinion. It's not my opinion. The only reason I say that, every time I seen Adrian Bronner in the same building as Javante Davis, I've never seen Javante Davis hanging with Adrian Bronner. I've seen some fighters that's with Adrian Bronner. I've never seen Javante Davis with Adrian Bronner. And I was even in um um the dressing room area of Javante and I I've never seen Adrian Broner in there. Never, bro. But as far as the habits, the social media and everything else that goes on with them out here just just acting uh reckless sometimes. I get what people can make that connection. Real talk. But when it comes to um Shakur Stevenson, what I like about him is his discipline. You know, he stays in shape. You know, he got his grandfather over there. He has a whole freaking, you know, New Jersey brick city that he's supporting and doing big things for. So I like his whole mentality, bro. I like Devin Haney's mentality. Devin Haney, too. Always in shape. Always in the gym. And if Javante want to get mad that Floyd Mayweather is training Devin Haney, he need to ask himself, why? Why is Floyd Mayweather trying to train the op? As Javante said, Javante say Devin Haney the op and Floyd Mayweather trying to train him. But when you're good, you're good. When you're great, you're great, man. And um, these fighters, at one point in time, I hope they fight each other. I hope Shakur Stevenson is able to fight Devin Haney. Um, if not at 135, at 140, if Devin Haney, Devin Haney is moving up to 140 sooner or later. Guarantee it. But Devin Haney, Shakur Stevenson, Javante Davis, um, you know, I can't say for silly Lomachenko will be in that equation. I don't know. But even Tiafimo Lopez, I would like to see Shakur Stevenson face Tiafimo Lopez at a higher weight. Because Tiafimo Lopez is thinking about moving up to 140. But when it's all said and done, Shakur Stevenson, his mentality right now, in my opinion, everything he's saying, he's putting it into fruition. He's putting it into play. He said he was going to move up to 130. He did. People try to call Carabayo a bum. He went in there and dispersed the bum then in six rounds. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you're saying the man fought a bum, he went in there and dispersed him. For, for sure. You know, I, I feel like as far as Shakur and Devin, you know, I feel like 
Devin Haney, he's too big for Shakur, you know, right? Especially right now, Shakur was at 126. He just had his first fight at 130. Devin Haney said he got two more fights at 135. Then he moving up to 140. So, um, will they ever, ever be in that same weight class at the same time? That's you know, that's the question. And um, you know, Shakur, Shakur, you know, he's he's um at 130 right now, and uh, Devin gonna be at 140. So how how will they meet up? You know what I mean? Which weight will it be? You know, so and they friends as well. And I remember um Jay Prince Jr. No, Jay Prince Sr. Jay Prince said that um, you know, when they asked him about Shakur fighting Devin Haney, uh Jay Prince said that um, you know, that's the homie son. That's the homie son talking about Bill Haney. And he said, uh, you know, if it happens, it happens. He said it's gonna be later, but uh it sounds like, you know, it, I don't know if it, it'll ever happen, but I can see Shakur fighting fighters like Javante because Javante going to be at 135. I could see him fighting people like possibly a Lomachenko. You know, a Lomachenko. Will, I don't think Loma is going to leave 135, if I'm not mistaken. And no, they all on top small. rank. Yeah, true. He's too small. He's too I small. Know, I never said Lomachenko was leaving. I'm just saying Devin Haney. I believe Devin Haney. T-O. Yeah, Devin Haney. Tia Fimo is gonna gonna leave before anybody. You know, Tia Fimo, you know, according to how this bout goes with Facility Lomachenko, he's moving up to 140 regardless. Him and his dad always said that. But you know how I think Devin Haney and Shakur Stevens are gonna link up, bro? It's gonna be their age. They both young. They gotta be in the same division sooner or later. We gotta wait and see because Devin is. Devin is growing. Devin is about to move up to 140. He said two two more fights and he's gone. And Shakur just moving up to 130. You know what I mean? So it might be at welterweight. If Shakur, you think Shakur can go to 147? You think he will eventually? Absolutely. And and their age, bro. I mean, come on, their age. Both of these guys are growing into their frame well. Devin Haney and Shakur Stevenson. And they're young hitters in the sport. So you just can't keep on changing out suitcases. You 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 can't change out the um, divisional suitcases and think you're gonna continue to travel. Things get real different. You can't just say, okay, I'm going to 35, I'm going to 140, I'm going to um, 147. It, it's not gonna work like that. But the good thing about both of these fighters, they both young, and they are able to move up. Shakur Stevenson, he's already at 130 temporarily. He go up the lightweight. Um, get a belt up there and then around it's going to be around 140 147 that i believe devin haney and shakur stevens to be floating around in the same division um if devin haney saying he has two more fights i'm curious to know who he's gonna fight like who is devin haney gonna fight at 135 is he gonna get the lomachenko fight is he gonna get the javante fight um nobody want to see him fight ryan garcia Ryan Garcia don't even want to take no nobody. Um, who he's gonna fight? Richard Comey. I mean, you got to start bringing up some names, man. You know, because one the one good thing about Devin Haney, he has the WBC title. You remember uh, Lomachenko get? You know, Lomachenko went to that um, to the WBC and requested the franchise belt. You know, to avoid right. a Devin Haney fight. You know, so. Devin, he's staying at 135 right now because uh, he wants that Lomachenko fight. You know what I mean? He wants the Lomachenko fight. Devin Haney wants a Tiafimo. He wants Javante Davis and all these uh, fighters. He won a Ryan Garcia. But do they do they want him? That's the question. You know what I mean? Lomachenko gave up his WBC world title to avoid a Devin Haney. So, you know what I mean? I love Devin Haney, to be honest. I feel like Devin Haney, you know, he reminds me of a young Floyd Mayweather Shakur Stevenson reminds me of a, a young Pernell Whitaker. And if they do fight, it's going to be a great, great fight. You know what I mean? And the, like Shakur, he's still a champion at 126, right? If I'm right. not mistaken. Yeah. So, w yeah, so he's still fighting at 126 and 130. And Devin going to be at 140. So, if, so do you think by the time Devin, you know, by, by the time Shakur comes up to 140, you think Devin will still be at 140? Will he be at 147 by then? It's according to the competition that's at 140. Because you know what well as I do. Who's holding belts at 140, man? I mean, that division was like, uh, you know what I'm saying? Josh Taylor. We we don't know if Regis Progray is going to be, 
you know, re look, that's that's a that, that's a good question because check this out. Regis Prograce was supposed to face Maurice Hook at a catch weight, right? So um, Maurice Hooker kind of changed up the game plan, man, moved the goalposts a little bit and say, nah, you got to come up the welterweight and fight me. So therefore, other scuttlebutt come out that Regis Prograce thinking about, you know, going back down to 140 and rematching Josh Taylor. You know what I'm saying? So 140 has, has not been on fire. Like we're waiting for 140 to be on fire. And I think the only way it's going to turn up is when Teofimo Lopez move up to 140, Devin Haney move up to 140, you get all those star power names in the, in the same division. Now you have no choice but to face each other. In the meanwhile, Shakur Stevenson, he's going to be making his rounds at 130, 135. But guess what? Devin Haney can move up to 140 before Shakur Stevenson or even 147. Do you see Devin Haney going up to 154 in his lifetime? I don't think so. Yeah, I can see. He big though. So? Devin five nine. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so because Devin is five nine. Devin, he kind of big, like his shoulders too. They kind of like he yeah. kind of big. So I could see him, you know, moving up to one fifty four. Floyd Mayweather did it, and Floyd started off at one thirty. Floyd, May Floyd Mayweather started off at one thirty, moved up to one fifty four. I think Devin can do it. He got the size. He got the size. I think that's that might be where he he ends his career. I think at one fifty four, that's the max. That and, he can and, go that's, and that's kind of the vision above why I said Shakur Stevenson. But they're both young. They're too young in the game for them not to be in the same division at the same time. They're too young. For sure. That's a dream fight. You're right. But, you know, just to speak on 140 real quick, I kind of like that division right now. I'm going to be honest, man. Uh, I do like Josh Taylor as a fighter, man. He he looked good against Regis Prograde, to be yeah. honest. He looked real good against him. And uh, even – uh. You got fighters like Jose Ramirez as well. Hold Jose up, okay. Ramirez, Josh Taylor, potential undisputed match right there at 140. You know, um, even Mikey Garcia, he's floating around at 140 as well. Mikey is still a big name. Mikey's a big name in the sport. Um, you know, imagine if you get Devin Haney, Tiafimo Lopez, Mikey Garcia, Josh Taylor, and Jose Ramirez all at 140. You know what I mean? And I feel like Josh Taylor... And Jose Ramirez, they might be on their way out of 140 really soon, too. Correct. Josh Taylor, they're trying to get that Terrence Crawford fight. I think the winner of Josh Taylor, Jose Ramirez, could possibly fight um, uh, Terrence Crawford in the future as well. But Jose Ramirez, him moving up just because he was unified champion, it would be good if he unified the 140-pound division. Let's be honest. It would be good if he's able to do that. reason I'm saying that is because Terrence Crawford – is getting so much backlash for, for, for just like having three divisions and not having nothing else to go along with it. So if Jose Ramirez move up to 147 and face Terrence Crawford, that would be a pretty decent name because it would be legitimized by Jose Ramirez being an undisputed champion. You know what I'm saying? He unified right now with him being an undisputed at 140, if that's possible, to move up and face the WBO champion in Terrence Crawford. That'll look good for Crawford and Ramirez. You're right. You're right. And Jose Ramirez, he got a, a lot of fans. He got a whole lot of fans, you know, so that'll be a big fight for Crawford. Even um, Josh Taylor, too. Josh Taylor, bro, he beat Victor Postal. He beat the same guy yeah. that Crawford beat. You know, he beat uh, uh, Regis Prograde. So th th that'll be a good fight. And he beat another guy, Ivan uh, Berichek. Ivan Berichek, is, he's a beast, too. He's about to be fighting on ESPN really soon, I think, and in July. So he's going to be coming up on ESPN. So I just feel like, you know, 140 is heating up. Josh Taylor going to be moving up to 147 and Jose Ramirez going to be moving up quick. I think Jose Ramirez is a unified champion right now, right? At 140 since Absolutely. he beat Maurice Tucker. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So man, there's some big fights that's going to happen in the sport of boxing. My brother, I appreciate you having me. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to come to your platform. And I wanted to tell you, you know, I, I, I watched your interviews a while ago. I remember, when you was in the gym with Wilder, when Wilder was on that jump rope, you know, I think you was over there with Nestor Gibbs. Nestor yeah. Gibbs of the boxing voice was around. He was, he was in the gym with you at that time. So, you yeah. know what I mean? Um, yeah, man, that's the first time I saw your video. Thank you for having me, my brother. And you know, if you could come to my channel one time and you could hop on a panel with me, I would appreciate that too, my brother. 
Hey, for sure, Ace Money. I, I don't know, you know, I ain't know too much about you, but you know, it's you know how how some of these um platforms get real funny. You know, I ain't out here compete with cats. I'm a, I'm an old school dude. You know what I'm saying? Um, I appreciate you stopping through and dropping some real solid boxing dialogue. And and the only and the reason why I say that is that for me, I just if I'm if I'm communicating with somebody on the platform and having a, a boxing dialogue, I want to be productive. You know what I'm saying? And you brought up some solid points today. I'll be sure to cross thread, man, and, and and travel over over there. Keep on doing what you're doing, man. And and salute to you, man. Keep on grinding, bro. For sure. I appreciate it, brother. So that's how you do it. You usually uh drop the link in the beginning of the show. That's how I can hop on with you. How does it work? Yeah, man. If you want people to hop on your platform, all you do is just drop the link on that. And you know, and 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 it's whoever you allow, you know what I'm saying? Like it's some people that won't show their face. If you ain't showing your face, I, I don't have time to talk to you. You know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> anybody, anybody can be sitting back there and you don't know who they are just talking shit. But yeah, I dropped the link in there, man. And if you want to allow somebody to come on, then that's that's what it is. So you you drop the link in the beginning of the show all the time. Like the very yeah, beginning. Oh, it don't, like, it oh, don't matter, gotta... bro. It don't matter when you drop the link. Okay. Like, okay. Like, sure. like you can, like when you be in your studio, you, you have StreamYard. Yes, I got StreamYard just like yeah. you. Yep. You can just goddamn once you once you hit the link, and then you know you hit copy. You can drop it anytime, man. Al, okay. I see, I see you, I see you, um, Hefe, but you need to show your face, bro. I ain't gonna bring you on unless you show your face, man. But yeah, so, that's um, that's what it is. That H money. For sure, for sure. So, uh, but, but when you do it, when you drop the link on your show, you do it in the very beginning. That's how you do it, or you drop it just randomly throughout the show. How does it work with you? If I plan on having somebody come through, then I'll drop the link in the beginning. If if okay. if it's like an open forum or whatever, and I want to talk on a specific topic, and I know the no, I know the topic is hot. I'll say, okay, go ahead. I'll drop it. It'll be the first thing I do in the live chat. And then I allow, you know, certain people to come on um, and talk about, the, you know, talk about the talking points and the subject. For it's, sure, it's for totally sure. Up to you. It's totally up to you, H Money, on how you want to do it. Like, you can hold off on the link. And then when you see somebody in the live chat and you see them make a comment, you can say, hey, man, jump on. You just drop the link on there or drop the link um, to their um, messenger or email or however you want to do it, bro. For sure, for sure. Okay. Well, one more question before I go. So you know Fred from Barbershop, right? Yeah, I do. Fred from Barbershop. Okay. I know so about him. You, I don't I don't really know him. Like we we ain't really communicated and all that. Okay, okay. I'm just checking. You know what I mean? Uh, sometimes I go to his show and I, I hop on the panel and just talk about boxing. You know what I mean? But I just wanted to know because I, I'm pretty sure y'all been around the same uh you know, y'all y'all probably been around the same places with each other, you know what I mean. So, I see so them in passing. I, I see them guys in passing sometime. I mean, when 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 the boxing when the boxing arenas was open up, bro, we see each other all the time. Like you see Fred and them, man. You 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 see the boxing voice. You you see all these cats from these different boxing media platforms on deck. But now that the COVID nineteen is here, that shit has changed, bro. For sure, I see El Jefe. El, I know El Jefe. El Jefe, man, he's not into that stuff, man. He he just want to talk boxing. He ain't into the drama and all of that. You know what I mean? And he, he got a rule that people got to show their face on his channel. You know what I mean? So uh, I respect I respect his rules, bro. So, you know what I mean? If you want to hop all, on, he said you got to show good. your face. It's all good. He's, he put on there, he want to talk. I didn't know who he was, man. I think he he jumped on here once. You know, I'm 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 just from that different. Like every now and then, he mentioned the UGC situation. I look, I don't He's have not no into that. Whatever, but I'm definitely not gonna get him any shine. And the conversation, in my opinion, is is light because you you talking about a different group of cats, and I'm not gonna give him a shine. But if you if you know him, yeah. I, don't, I don't have no problem with him I, coming I, on here. I know him. I know him. But El Jefe, bro, he just don't. I mean, talk about boxing. Nobody cares about that nonsense, bro. Nobody care about the UGC, bro. You know what I mean? This is talk about boxing, bro. You know what I mean? Talk about boxing, bro. Appreciate that, though, my brother. World Combat Sports, man. Come through. Holler at me, bro. Salute, man. 
Thanks for dropping through H Money, man. Keep for on sure. grinding, bro. And thanks for dropping on the platform. I'll be back. I'll be back. See exactly. D Ray don't even know what that is. Stop giving those dudes shine, bro. You know what I mean? But appreciate it, bro. I'll be back, bro. I'm going to come All back right. and talk to you. All right, man. Take All it right. easy, bro. Salute. For sure. Peace. Hey, that was um, Asian Money, um, Mr. The Zone, man. I only heard, I saw him pop on my live chat once before, but I, I thought it was a very conducive boxing topics. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid of any smoke, man. Let me. Hey, I was just about to damn bring you on, bro. Where you go, F.A.? I was just about to bring you on. You know what I'm saying? Hey, F.A., drop back through, man. I was just about to bring you on. I, I'm not afraid of the smoke, man. I'm not. I just didn't want to get them dudes um, who you was talking about any, any, any shine because it ain't worth anything I got to talk about. But, but drop back through, man. Hit the link. Drop back through, man. We'll chat. Real talk. Um, let me get to the comments, man. D-Ray in the building. Salute to you, man. I heard Oscar um, call Buddy EJ. What are your thoughts? Hey man, I don't hey every time I hear Oscar name, bro. I'm just wondering, you know, cup and urine, bro. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, you know, syringe, extract the blood, man. You know, is he sober? Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, he's talking about he see Mike Tyson. Listen, Mike Tyson has some pretty good people doing the video and editing. Okay. Mike Tyson looks very, very the clips that they're they're splicing together. Oh boy, looks good. Mike Tyson looks good. But when Oscar De La Hoya comes back, who never had a personality, but is a well-respected, um, you know, boxer in our history, um, I, I just don't see why he would come back. Don't do it. Don't do it. Mike Tyson, if he's coming back and with, with the history that Iron Mike has, people are going to gravitate to Mike. You know what I'm saying? Mike Tyson used to be a menace. Both in and out, out the ring, man. When people see that shit, people want to gravitate. When they make a video of Mike Tyson hitting the mitts like that, even though mitts don't mean shit to me. It don't, it don't mean shit to me. Because at the end of the day, you have to go in there and fight an opponent. You know what I'm saying? But him calling out Bud, man. Bud will wash. Bud and e, um, EJ will wash freaking Oscar, man. Don't, don't do it, Oscar. Don't do it. Um, of course, you love De Devin Haney. He's he's the zone. Of course, yeah. I I, I didn't want to say anything, but yeah, you're right. Um, Hooker still at forty. From 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 my um, gauge, is that you know Hooker was basically taking the elevator up to one forty seven. Okay, so therefore, a fight was supposed to happen between him and Regis Prograce at a catch weight, in which the COVID nineteen took place. And I believe it was supposed to be in 143, 144. So somehow Maurice Hooker wants to renegotiate without telling team freaking progress. <laughs> and he's saying, no, nah, you got to come up the welterweight and fight me. And um, Regis like, no, that, that, that wasn't in the contract. I'm not ready to move up the welterweight. That's not going to happen. So we don't know if we're going to see that fight. And if we do see that fight, if Maurice Hooker going to fight at a catch weight, that's what we want to see. Um, do it. Um, Oscar help pass the torch. Well, I think the torch is out. Isn't the torch is, isn't the torch been out for a minute? You know what I'm saying? At one point in time, you know, Muhammad Ali carried the, the, the freaking Olympic torch. Like, isn't the torch out? You know, Roy Jones carried the torch at one point. You know, I mean, Lennox Lewis carried the torch. Floyd Mayweather, he ain't really let go of the torch. Like, whenever he chooses to blaze, blaze it up, he comes back and do what he has to do and then leave. You know what I'm saying? Um... When does passing the torch for Oscar become something the fans want to see? Like, who is he passing the torch? I will only say Oscar being who he is, if he was to come back and fight somebody that's not even in the weight class, I can't even really give it. 
I really can't give Oscar any like who is he gonna fight, man? Like Canelo Alvarez. I mean, he can't come back and fight Canelo Alvarez and that be considered passing the torch because Canelo Alvarez, he's on a freaking tear right now. Like he's just walking around boxing, taking a old, you know, taking a stroll and doing what the fuck he want to do. So what can Oscar De La Hoya do to pass the torch off? He can't do it to Ryan Garcia because Ryan Garcia and him don't get along. Plus, he's in a whole different weight division. And we all know Oscar De La Hoya is not going to be able to drop down to lightweight. He's definitely not getting in there and getting his ass knocked out against Canelo Alvarez. It's not going to happen. <clears throat> Can Oscar still sell a PPV, bro? Good question. It depends. When it comes to PPVs, man, you know it all depends on who's standing across the ring. We all know that. That's what sells PPVs. Just look at the whole thing. Just look at it. I tell people this all the time, whether they want to hear it or not. The only reason Anthony Joshua sold out Wembley Stadium was because he had Vladimir Klitschko standing across the ring. That's why that fight did so many. Um, the, the numbers was good with that particular fight because of who was across the ring. So PPV absolutely has a lot to do with who's riding tandem in that particular match. Who are you fighting? That's what PPV has to do it, period. That's what it all boils down to. And you know, when it comes to Oscar De La Hoya, he has to have somebody in the ring that is going to be a threat, definitely. And he's going to be a, and, and, and potentially be in a position to cause Oscar De La Hoya problems. You know, one that understands the respect that will let Oscar get off a little bit. And then when it comes time to, to putting it on him and put it on him, um, you just can't go in there and dominate and say, okay, I'm selling the PPV and then go in there and knock Oscar out in one round. You know what I'm saying? Um, a, a, a typical fighter who has knockout power, who's aggressive. And we know at Oscar's age, he would get absolutely destroyed. You can't just bring him in there with somebody who's not willing to play ball. You know, it has to be somebody that's willing to play ball because we all know Oscar De La Hoya cannot sell a PPV. He absolutely had no personality whatsoever. Him and Canelo damn near have the same personality. Like, come on, man. Oscar De La Hoya has no freaking personality to sell a PPV. Zero. Canelo edges him out just a little bit. You know what I'm saying? He can, you know, with the right people around. But when I saw him and Triple G was in separate rooms leading up to the freaking fight. I was like, that's, that's, that's like prima donna shit. Like y'all supposed to be the best fighters. Why y'all in separate rooms? Why y'all not nose to nose, head to head? Why y'all not got down in each other's space? Like Lennox Lewis and Hasim Rothman. You know, why y'all not in each other's space? Like Floyd Mayweather and Victor Ortiz. You know what I'm saying? Jose Benavidez and Terrence Crawford. Why are you not in your face like the Zab Judas? I mean, come on. We, we, I mean, I'm not even going to go down to the Mexican fighters on how they get down and how they get face to face. What about the Bernard Hopkins? You know? I mean, it's plenty of fighters up there that can sell a PPV from the press conference alone, from the weigh-ins alone. They can sell a PPV. But then you got Oscar De La Hoya you can just walk all over him and back, man. And he's not going to do too much of anything. You know, the respect I have for Oscar De La Hoya is the performances that he put in, you know, the work that he put in in the ring. Um, that's I, I respect the shit out of him for that. But right now, in this get this time for him to come back to the sport, he needs the perfect opponent. He needs the right weight class. He needs the perfect opponent. And that's the only thing that's going to help him sell a PPV event especially during COVID-19. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, if you talk too much blood with swing. Well, check this out. You remember um, um, Jose Benavidez, though? You, you remember what happened with that? Jose Benavidez, you know, kind of kind of gave the first, you know, through the first, and then Crawford responded. 
But I believe if Crawford truly wanted to step in and touch Benavidez, he could have. You know what I'm saying? With no hesitation. Like, if Crawford really wanted to get close, he could have. But I would want to see somebody, if you're talking about, you know, somebody coming back from retirement like Mike Tyson, all Mike Tyson does have to make a video. He has to make a freaking short clip of him hitting the mitts with somebody who knows him very well, edit it, speed it up just a little bit, shorten the clips, and um, people are going to put it on IG and, and, and just look at it and be like, God damn, Mike looks good. You know what I'm saying? Mike's look good. He's in damn good shape, y'all. Look at the way Mike. And it, look, a lot of people can make a video on the mitts, but Mike Tyson is making a video of vintage Mike Tyson. The hooks, the back and forth lateral, that's vintage Mike Tyson. Everybody can't do that shit. Everybody can't make a video and, and, and have their own patented vintage movement like Mike Tyson. You just got to be that person, man. Oscar and Manny at 54. Hmm. Oscar and Manny at 54. You're talking about two people that can't promote shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Look, you would have to go strictly off resume, yo. And nothing else. You have to go strictly off the combination of them coming together and, and, and combining their careers in boxing to make that fight because neither one of them can promote a damn fight at all. Manny Pacquiao is extra nice, but he has the Filipino nation behind him. Oscar De La Hoya, I can't say the Mexicans are going to be lined up to support Oscar, man, when it comes to Manny. I, I, I can't call it, bro. I can't call it. I cannot sit up here and think that, you know, the Filipinos will be the main um, flow of traffic when it comes to selling the PPV and seeing Manny step in there with Oscar. And then at 154, I think I think it'll be, you know, at this at this age for both of them, Manny Pacquiao in his 40s, Oscar, it, it, you know, on paper, the fight looks great. For some apparent reason, you know, um, serve drinks at the door, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I still think Manny Pacquiao is too much for Oscar right now. It's too fast, especially if he's not, you know, if it's not a cup and urine, um, Manny Pacquiao potentially would go in there and stop Oscar De La Hoya, point blank. He would give Oscar the problem. What's going on, line killer? Salute to you, man. You know, y'all be sure to um, subscribe to his channel always, man. Salute, man. Thanks for dropping in. I was there when Jose and Bud weighed in. Oh, okay. That's what's up, man. I mean, that's not the first, like, I know that that particular weigh-in had intensity to it. Um, but I know it wasn't as chaotic as 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 um Tank Davis and Yorkies Gamboa weigh in. That shit was that shit was mayhem. But yeah, I can I can see it, it being a little frenetic in there, man. But Tank Davis coming in late, you know, down south, us having not having a, a big boxer come down here and show us love like this, and for him to be late and one pound over, hey. I knew when Floyd Mayweather left the left the um the way in, I knew something was up. I said, why would Floyd Mayweather leave before Tank get here? Why would he leave? And and that and that goes to show you why. Because Floyd Mayweather wasn't going to be in that melee. He wasn't going to be in all that shit. So he already knew what was up. He said, Hey man, whatever you do, this is the time to do it. They restless up in there, give them something to talk about. And that's what Tank did. He came in a pound over, stare down, and he shoved Gamboa. And the rest is what it was. It was, it was, it was goddamn, it was classic, bro. It was classic. And I and I know I know Floyd had something to do with it. Yeah, man. I don't believe Manny Pacquiao and Oscar can, can promote that shit, man. You know, 
um, at the end of the day, they two very um, banal type of dudes. And I don't, I don't believe that Manny Pacquiao will have anything disrespectful to say about Oscar. Oscar's not going to have anything disrespectful to say about Manny. That's just not enough in this time to bring those two together and um, expect to do big numbers. It, it's just not it. It's just not it, man. Is the cup? Hey, I believe so, bro. You know, people look, people want to kick kick me out of the groups when I mention that. Come on, why can't I mention the cup and urine? If Manny fought Lucas Matisse, Adrian Broner, man, and Keith Thurman, and he it wasn't that testing, regulated testing that we're looking for. Why can it not be discussed? Why are people sitting up here? Oh man, we, we love Manny Pacquiao. I never said I didn't love the guy as a boxer. I never said that. I never said I didn't. But call it for what it is. He looked really good against Keith Thurman. And we know damn well what was going on in that particular lead up and with the testing and everything else. People can say what the fuck they want to say. But Manny Pacquiao is a multi-division champion. And at this stage of his life, why is he being avoided? Oh, no. Why is he able to be granted? a waiver, a pass, and not being required to be in strict drug testing. Why? Why? The dude is still, look, the dude is holding a WBA super title and he's over 40. But yet, we don't, we, we're not hearing his names come up to face somebody like Crawford, Spence, we don't want to we don't want to see Sean Porter come in and fight Manny Pacquiao because in my opinion Sean Porter the way he fought Errol Spence he would dog the shit out of Manny Pacquiao especially if he's tested you know what I'm saying so I, I'm not looking forward to seeing somebody else come in here and pick up the belt I want to see Terrence Crawford fight Manny Pacquiao or Errol Spence I really want to see a closure come together a bridge the gap in the welterweight division terrence crawford beats manny pacquiao period give him two belts errol spence two belts and let's make this fight happen in 2022 2021 2022 let's make this shit happen you know what i'm saying by the end at the end of 2021 hopefully um the arenas will start coming up with some type of regulation to allow fans to return to the arena and we're able to go visit boxing and then we can make the PPV and we can have a gate and these fighters can start inking contractual agreements to fight each other. And that seems to be the holdup between Terrence Crawford and Errol Spence. It cannot be done without a gate. It's fucked up. But um, let's see. Let's see what it is, man. Um, it's still a lot of people I'm seeing on the timeline. I know some people drop some stuff in the inbox, man, and they're still talking about, you know, the situation with Deontay Wilder and the Torkin situation. And I'm saying to myself, like. However, the video got leaked. I, I, I just don't understand how the video was leaked if by chance, you know, um, his fiance was recording it. Now, it's not like it's a sex scandal video. It's not like it's something that's inappropriate. The man was having fun around his family, wherever he was on his property. Right now, like I said before, I've never and never will be. I never would be if the dance was popular and being an idea dance back in the day. But it wasn't anything to that. It was like break dancing and popping and all that. It wouldn't be a dance that I myself would do. The only time I actually went down like that was when you, when you know the old school cats know what it is. When when you dancing on the dance floor with a female and she start breaking that shit all the way to the floor and you try to go as low as she can. You know what I'm saying? That's it. As far as doing this, 
I don't, I don't, I don't see it as being any other way besides having fun for him. So why people are dogging him out once again is just motherfuckers that just don't like the look. They just don't like Deontay Wilder, man. They don't like it because look, it's fuckboy shit. When you sit up here and give a pass to Tyson Fury kissing another man in the mouth in the ring in front of millions, and then Deontay Wilder twerking, you got to give the you, you have to give more energy. You have to turn on the blowtorch and say, okay. Which one will we vilify Deontay Wilder for most? Leaning over and kissing another man in the mouth as a black fighter? Or twerking? Come on, man. Y'all y'all trying so hard to put this man and defame his name just for him having fun. The man ain't getting locked up. He ain't being kicked out of the sport for drugs. He ain't in a scandal right now. The only thing that happened was that he lost. And that comes with the sport. He lost his belt to Tyson Fury. That's it. Ain't nobody can accuse him of cheating. Ain't nobody accuse him of having loaded gloves. Nobody's accused him for, for, for um, taking padding out his gloves. Nobody's accused him for freaking throwing elbows when he when he throw the hooks. You know what I'm saying? You know, whenever he get around to throw the hook. Uh, nobody uh, accused him of, of throwing extra low blows in a fight just so he can take a breath, spitting out his gum shield like Joshua just to get extra time. Man, y'all really on some fuckboy shit. That's the only that's the only two words I can use for it. It's fuckboyism. Because if you're going to say that a neighboring fighter like Tyson Fury can kiss a dude in the mouth, a grown ass man. And it's okay because you know what? That's what the Brits do. No, the, the Brits don't do that. They don't just sit up here and kiss another man in the mouth. They don't lean over to Tom Swartz and say, oh, man, you're a handsome guy. Like you want to date him. So you can't sit up here and say a man like Deontay Wilder who's twerking by himself is falls within the realm of being suspect. You know what's suspect is that people are so quick to put that on black men grown black men that oh we got to walk on eggshells we wear a certain thing oh man so and so suspect you know how you can find you know if somebody suspect you can see it i can know if a motherfucker has an ounce of bitch in him I, just, just that much you can tell you can you can sit up here and tell dude you can tell you, you understand who's the alpha and you understand the ones that have been beta most of their lives. They will show you a sign. They will, they will, if it's not in their language, it's in their mannerisms, y'all. So y'all need to chill, man. Y'all need to chill with that. That's all I'm saying. Y'all, y'all need to chill. I, and you know what? I see a lot of, of my own people going hard. They going hard on Wilder for him twerking they going hard on a brother he wasn't twerking with a dude he was twerking by himself with his fam his peeps relatives i'm not taking up for anything i'm just saying people are quick to put that stigma on black people they always quick to demasculize you know what i'm saying like it's a lot more to be worried about if you're gonna allow neighboring fighters to kiss a grown man in the mouth and feel it's okay. But yet if Deontay Wilder was to do that in front of millions, his own people would never come to see him fight. The way he went to the Staples Center, they'd be holding up signs like we was protesting. And they'd be goddamn calling, calling him all sorts of names, man. He walked into the MGM Grand, people would be like, well, um, Wilder, we're going to get to the fight, but first, I need to ask you a question. Um, since I've been here in America, it's been a lot of banter. It's been a lot of talk about the kiss that you you gave the last time you was out. You know, I mean, um, what was that about? Is there some type of extra energy we don't know about? I mean, you would get that shit, man. People would be like creating storylines. Means, means hurt feelings this day and time. You know what I'm saying? So when I hear my people are, you know, um, 
pushing the current to to degrade, destroy, belittle, just sit up here and find out ways to say, okay, Deontay Wilder suspect. No, nigga, you suspect. You suspect for always talking about one little itty bitty thing that makes a man suspect. It's, it's certain qualities that you can see when a dude is a suspect type of dude. They will show you their hands sooner or later. Their comments and their language will show you they're suspect. One ounce, they will show you that shit. But don't just sit up here and say, well, you know, um, so-and-so suspect just because he came out with a twerk video by himself when he was chilling with his girl. Now, I will be the first to say I came out and I, I felt that flip the switch. Every man that was in that flip the switch video with that girl and you put on a dress. Absolutely. I'm going to say you suspect. Now that shit right there. You wouldn't have heard me on here talking anything about anyone um, defending them if they would have did the flip the switch shit. These motherfuckers that's flipping the switch and wearing a dress? No. Nah. No, nah, shawty. This is what we say down south. No, nah, shawty. Not even. Like T.I. say, let's be clear. <laughs> let's be clear. You in a video with your girl with the flip the switch shit and you are putting on a damn dress don't come on here talking about, oh, uh, man, I'm, I'm secure within myself. No, motherfucker. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Nah. Don't try to convince me of shit. But anyway, back to boxing, man. Don't try to convince me of a motherfucking thing. Because you did what you did, and that's what it is, man. As you look in the description of the current, of the uh, fight card that's coming up, you know, I put the entire main event that's down there in the fight card. Um, it's, a, it's a light fight card. But once again, it's always good to look at these, these fighters that's coming up and getting extra airplay. Because that's what it's about, man. You always look at these young fighters coming up, man. And, and you get introduced, especially as media, you get introduced. So you can, you know, start zooming in your interest to some of these other fighters because some of these guys are looking forward to being on TV. They're like, hell yeah. I get some exposure. I wouldn't have gotten if boxing never would have went to a shutdown. So now it's picking up. It's trying to generate. Yeah, pay attention to these, these, um, these names you're not familiar with. Hell yeah. You know, just like the Miguel Contreras fight, man. Very, very. Um, good fight between him and Rolando Vargas. Very entertaining. Very entertaining. And then, you know, Andrew Maloney comes down here and he's 21 and 0. Hey, man, that shit was a good fight. You know what I'm saying? Give it up to Joshua Franco, man. Give it up. Picking up the belt, man. Give it up, man. Salute. You know, he got Robert Garcia. Hey, give it up, man. What better feeling? You in an arena with no fans and you go in there and win a title against a guy who's undefeated and I believe with 17 knockouts. Give it up, man. Salute to him. Um, also, while I'm on this subject, Emmanuel Navarrete, right? I heard somebody saying like, listen, you get some platforms that will always dog out. Like, I'm just going to put it out there like, it's some platforms that consist of my people once again. They will sit up here and glorify black fighters all day long, right? But I believe that if they if, if you truly understand the mindset of reporting on boxing, you have to have a lucid perception on what that consists of. That means you have to look at it with both eyes and you have to assess it without being extremely biased, all right? And you have to provide your analytics off your knowledge and what you are looking at. You have to provide that knowledge to the audience and make them understand that you're not leaning heavily on one way. You know, you're not up here just always going to lean one way. And when I hear people up here talking about Navarrete, you know, um, Shakur Stevens will watch Navarrete. I'm like saying to myself, 
Do y'all do y'all actually pay attention to how Navarrete boxes? I'm not saying he'd go in there and and beat Shakur Stevenson, but when I hear platforms of certain individuals that um lean heavily towards supporting only specific fighters, I don't agree with that because if you call yourself media, if you respect that you're media, right, you should be able to report on a match and a fighter non-biasedly just because i report on deontay wilder outside of anthony joshua doesn't make me biased with deontay wilder if i say deontay wilder is better than anthony joshua that's what i believe if i believe deontay wilder was going in there to defeat tyson fury that's what i believe coming off their first fight that's what i believe you know what i'm saying it didn't go that way after fact okay cool but when I say one loss, you just can't sit up here and listen to other fighters say, okay, one loss don't define a fighter, right? But then you get a fighter that's not really appreciated by his fans and he get one loss. And then you try to say he ain't never been shit when the person has 42 victories and 41 knockouts. You know what I'm saying? Do you know most of the MMA and boxers you bring up? People, I don't, I don't know. Thanks. I'm looking forward to watching the Blaze because of World Comeback Sport. <laughs> That's funny, man. I, I, I just have to sit back and 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 laugh at that. I mean, I'm not laughing in a facetious, you know, um, exaggerated manner. But me, I, I have to cover my my passion is to cover combat sports. So. You know, hearing you say that to my you, you um you don't know most of the MMA and boxers bring up. Um, I don't know. Thanks. I'm looking forward to, to watching the blaze because of world combat sports. I mean, you being genuine, I you know, I can only salute you for that. I I, I appreciate your input, man. You know what I'm saying? That's the only thing I can say about that. Because for me, um, I just like the grassroots fighters. I like specific, I like combat sports in general. I love it. I like it as a passion to report on it, but I'm not going to get on here every time and basically um, be critical of other platforms that report strictly on black fighters or platforms that strictly on Mexican fighters or UK fighters because it's out there. It's out there. But the only reason I'm mentioning is because some of them would get up here and say World Combat Sports, he ain't a boxing channel. You're right. You're right. I'm not a boxing channel. You're right. I'm not an MMA channel. You're right. It's World Combat Sports, man. Trademarked and every World Combat Sports. I don't know what you got to do to define that, but it's considered a World Combat Sports. So if I have the Blaze Burns on here, Herbert, the Blaze Burns on here, believe me, I'm excited to talk to somebody who's competed on the elite level such as himself. And also watching him fight is always a point of education. It's no way, shape, or form me. I can get on here and talk about the same fighters all the time. Well, Errol Spence, he had an accident. Uh, his memory seemed to be coming back. Well, Terrence Crawford, he's sitting up here and possibly fight that. It's so I don't have a problem with, with reporting. I report on everybody. But they criticize us all the time on YouTube for not having a depth to our reporting skills. They call us YouTubers. I don't, I look at myself and I'll always tell you, I would say it's tough to basically do research on boxing and MMA. It's tough. It's tough to do boxing and MMA. No one's going to sit up here and, and ever convince me and say, you don't know shit about boxing. And you're definitely not going to say, you don't know shit about MMA. You have to find a commitment they say, you know, I'm going to report on both of them. Because sooner or later, you know, people will tune in. If I get five people here, ten people here, it's all good. Dude, I'm not going for no, no views, man. Let's get that straight. Like, I, I would like the views. But I'm not going for this, you know, all this monetization. You don't, you're not going to get rich off YouTube unless you're a very popular individual. Seriously, you got to put the time in. You got to have a, you got to have a um, 
the subjects, the talking points, and all that. But when you got somebody up here talk about boxing and MMA and can shift gears between first and six, or even spray if I have to, or sometimes it can just be supercharged right off the rip. Hey, that's what you're going to get, man. I, I, I have a passion for both of them. So, you know, if you're learning something, just like, you know, from MMA and you're not an MMA fan, tune in. Shit. Tune in to the Muddy Flats. That's what it's all about, man. But I've learned that you're not going to please everybody. And I've never been a pack rider. So, and, you know, you got some of these people that's going to sit up here and jump on the live chat and say they want to come over here and talk about something that happened on another. Every now and then I might pop on somebody else's chat. But when I feel that, you know, your exterior is softer than silk panties just because, you know, we have a simple dialogue and you want to be in control. I'm, I'm not used to rolling in a pack of, of, of dudes all the time and, and, and being, oh, yeah, you know, just checking the box. OK, and warming this motherfucker up, warming this motherfucker up, warming that. I, I just never I, I never would be cut that way. And when somebody tried to break me down and say something negative that's not true, that we ain't never met then of course I'm going to defend myself. It's easy to sit up there and have four or five people on your platform to all warm each other and butter each other up and, and, and rub goddamn cocoa butter on each other's ego and shit and talk about the same stuff all the time. Come on here and talk about boxing. Come in here and talk about MMA. Talk about Muay Thai. Talk about grappling. If you teach me something cool, we, we good. We good. You know what I'm saying? I want Amanda next. Um, Amanda. So um, I'm guessing you're talking about Amanda Nunez. I'm guessing. Amanda Nunez would be absolutely great to have on here if that's who you're talking about. But also um, there's a fight that's coming up. I appreciate, I appreciate you stopping through, D-Ray. And, you know, being that you're a vet, you know what it is, man. It's, it's always support, bro. It's always support. Um, Amanda Nunez, man, not to get too too far off of MMA because this is a catchweight episode of boxing. Yeah, it would be a pleasure, man, to talk to Amanda Nunez. She, she's one of the best females ever to grace the cage. Do I consider her the best women's combat sport practitioner ever in combat sports? Um, no, because a lot of people define the UFC as the highest tier of mixed martial arts. And, and Amanda Nunez, what she was able to do is become, you know, the Bantamweight champion, the featherweight champion. Okay. But then I look at Chris Cyborg, who's been a champion in four different organizations. No one has ever did that. So you can't say, well, just because Dana White or just because somebody else want to say, oh, Amanda Nunez is the best female combat sports practitioner ever. And it sticks. No, you have to look at what have they did in their combat sports career? You know, what have she did before she became a mixed martial artist? Just because she was able to come into the UFC. Well, she might be the best. UFC women's fighter of all time because she was able to achieve what she did and who she was able to defeat. You know what I'm saying? The Holly Holmes, the Valentina Shevchenko's, you know what I'm saying? The Ronda Rousey's, Chris Cyborg. Yeah, they're going to give her props. I give her her props. But um, Christine Cyborg has been champion in four different organizations. That's a bad woman. And then she also does, um, she did Muay Thai, kickboxing. I mean, she's a bad chick, man. But we don't know how that's going to play out, man. I know it's, a, it's another fight that's that's on deck um, that I totally forgot about. Um, what's the fight that's on, on deck next? I forgot. Damn. 
Who's supposed to be fighting on that fight? It's going to be a pretty good one, too. Oh, Paige Van Zandt. Paige Van Zandt is on her way back. Paige Van Zandt, man. Um, she only, I think she has three losses, but she has had problems with a broken arm. She 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 messed it up three times. She's coming back to face Amanda um, Hibas. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing Paige Van Zandt. It's the last fight on her contract, and she's looking for free agency. You know, she's basically said she makes more money on IG and, and sponsoring other people's stuff than she does um, in her UFC career. And also, she says she made more money on Dancing with the Stars than she did in her entire UFC career. And I believe her. I believe every bit of what she's saying. But she has had, you know, times where she stepped up the competition and she got subbed out. She she got she took a loss against Michelle Waterson. You know what I'm saying? She went in against loss against Thug Rose Number I mean, she's she's a good person. But um step out, man. Do other stuff. You are still young in the game. Step out and make your money. Because she's she's a very easy on the eyes and she absolutely can have an alternative career doing something else. You know what I'm saying? That's real talk. I like her personality and everything, man. <clears throat> Which female MMA fighter had her head busted and still submit the um submit the opponent? Um I'm trying to think because there was a lot of them that was bleeding like a mother. Like I remember when Michelle Waterson was in there um fighting and she got subbed out. You know, Michelle Waterson was subbed out by I believe Thug Rose Norman Unit. She was bleeding all to be damned. And then um, it was so many that was freaking bleeding and bloody, man, that they ended up losing the fight. I'm not sure if they was losing the fight because I'm, I'm trying to think, man, who can you possibly be talking about? What weight class? Because it's been some very bloody fights, but mostly in the men's division. So if it was last year and she was Brazilian, the only one I can think of um, is Claudia Cadelia or um, it, it wasn't Wally Zhang and you want a young J chick Brazilian. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know what weight class that was in. I know it wasn't in the flyweight division because they really haven't had bloody fights like that and one thing about the women's side of the house you'll be lucky if you see a women's fight bloody and everything continue to go on and 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 they continue to let the fight go I'm, I'm telling you it's much different than the guys um it's getting better to let them just flow that's what i like about mma they moved the women's fight back in the day it used to be three Three rounds, they moved them equal to the men championship fight. So who the hell was was bloody? I, I I can't remember right now, man. Um, H Money said, "What do you think about Kayla Harrison from the PFL?" Hey, Kayla Harrison's an Olympian, man. She's legit. She has an opportunity to make a name for herself. She is a bad fighter, but also another person is in her division that I interview is Laura Sanchez. Laura Sanchez is a tall, rangy striker. Very good in her jiu-jitsu game, which she's going to need against an um, Olympian like Kayla Harrison, who, who already won the 155-pound division. Now, check this out. The 155-pound division is a lightweight division. You know well as I do, the UFC doesn't have a lightweight division for the women. Their division stops at featherweight. And Dana White, you can guarantee this, people, if Dana White, is unfortunately have Amanda Nunez retire from the sport as the bantamweight and featherweight division, I can almost guarantee that featherweight division is going bye-bye. Because it's not enough women. Now, we can bring Holly Holmes back. We can we can bring Jermaine DeRandomy back. We can bring... Um, um, who else? Felicia Spencer. 
we, we can bring some people to try to keep that division thriving, but it's just not enough depth. So back to Kayla Harrison, the PFL salute to the tournament. I like the tournament format, but right now in her division, it's only like one or two females that's in the, in the 155 pound division. So until she steps in and face somebody at her weight, or she crosses over to the UFC and competes at the featherweight division, something to that sort. Um, I don't know. I don't know because uh, Kayla Harrison, man, she she has an outstanding Olympic pedigree. Outstanding. But now when you're competing in the professional arena, you need to fight somebody in order for you. I know you won the million dollars, but you really need to fight somebody to really solidify your legacy. You know what I'm saying? You already have the Olympic legacy. Now you need to bring some more competition. You, you're going to have to go to, you're going to have to drop down in weight. You're going to have to lose some of that muscle, drop down in weight, and potentially fight somebody in another organization. I'm just saying, man. I'm just saying. I like her. She's tough. But I'm definitely looking forward to seeing her and Laura Sanchez. You know what I'm saying? Um, which is a much taller fighter. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing them fight. And shout out to Laura Sanchez, man. Looking forward to see them. PFL was shut down for the rest of the year due to COVID-19. So I really look forward to them getting back into the groove. And for those of you that may not know what PFL is, it's Professional Fight League. All right? It used to be the World Series of Fighting, if I'm, not, if I'm correct. It used to be the World Series of Fighting, and then they transitioned over to PFL, which is a tournament-based MMA organization. I'm curious to know who that was, D-Ray. I'm not sure who that, that fighter was that was all bloody. Um, I, I'm, I'm still trying. Let me let me um do a research. Let, let me do a um research right quick. Uh, do a um an engine drop right quick. Let me see what I come up with. So you said she was Brazilian. So. But one thing that I'm curious about, you says submission. You know what I'm saying? Submission. Because I, I know a lot of female fights that was bloody. Like Jessica Penny, you know what I'm saying? Even Rose Number Unas and Paige Van Zant was pretty goddamn bloody. But you said Brazilian. I, I I can't I can't remember it right now, man. That's a good question, though. Let me check down here. Um, it's so it's so many times I've seen Paige Van Zant go in there. She's a tough look, man. Paige Van Zant is tough, man, for real. Oh man, it's been a while since I've seen this cauliflower ear, man. Jessica I versus Leslie Smith. Her cauliflower ear split. You rarely see females with cauliflower ear, but. You know, Le Leslie Smith does, and she got that shit split open like a watermelon for real. But I, I, I can't figure it out right now, man. Solid question, though. I just I just can't I just can't pinpoint put my put my hand on it. Shit. You know, on. um The bloodiest, though. <clears throat> but um, a lot that. Something I didn't talk about, though, was um, the future fights is coming up in boxing, man. 
we're looking forward to seeing that Tiafimo and Facility Lomachenko. And of course, we're looking forward to seeing that Tiff, um, that Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury fight. And we, we're definitely looking forward to seeing that. I'm looking forward to potentially seeing, like I said before, you know, um, Errol Spence come back and whoever he's choosing to fight. Now, earlier, someone talked about Maurice Lee. And I didn't get a, a whole lot of time to talk about it because I, I think the boxing voice, man, is credible and legitimate as the boxing voice is. Like, they're one of the, mo they're one of the most um, um, conducive channels out here, and they're doing big things, real talk. But that guy, Maurice Lee, got mad airtime. He, 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 look, he got unbelievable airtime on the boxing voice. And, and it was almost like he was just having fun with it. Like they was giving him a platform to sit up here and have his voice heard. And he was just making a mockery of the sport and himself. Now, of course, I would be the first to apologize if indeed Errol Spence is his next opponent. <laughs> I mean, Maurice Lee is Errol Spence's next opponent. I will, I will actually kowtow and be like, okay, cool, cool. I get it. But um, this dude was saying some shit like his whole team going to be in all white. He's having um, a, a, a slew of mega churches, the pastors coming there to the, to the fight, which we already know that's bullshit. He said that he was getting $10 million for the fight. Where's this money coming from? Like, how in the fuck is this dude getting $10 million? 10 fucking million for fighting Errol Spence. Come on, man. You're talking about Gennady Golovkin, Canelo Alvarez getting 15 and 15 a piece on, you know, before freaking the gate. I mean, how is this dude talking 10 million a piece? And just so happened, that's the same number that Adrian Broner was talking about that he wanted Al Heyman to give him 10 million or else he's going to become a full-time rapper. So let me go back to this dude. I don't even like talking about trolls, bro. It's too many of them working for free. So this dude, Maurice Lee, is saying he's going to stop Errol Spence. You know what I'm saying? He's going to go in there and basically shock the world. His record is 12 and 1, 5 KOs. And his last fight was September 2019. He fought. He fought four times. I would give him that credit. He fought four times in 2019. He fought Lenard Davis. Check check out the check out the ledgers now. Lenard Davis, four one and four. April 2019. Andre Bird, seven, five, and two. Um, June 2019, he fought Jonathan Steele, nine, three, and one. Also, the same Jonathan Steele I seen go in there and fight the Iceman, Malik Hawkins, in Baltimore. Can, he can fight. I ain't gonna lie, he can fight. He won a majority decision over Jonathan Steele. And then Dakota Linger, Linger. Um, September 2019 with a record 11 and 2. So, therefore, if you take, and he's a southpaw, like that matches up well with Errol Spence, okay? It doesn't even matter. I'm not going to sit up here and say, oh, who, who's the better southpaw and all this other shit. But check this out, though. So, do you think someone 12, 1, and 2 with five knockouts? Do you would think it's some type of genius for him, being that he's at the Floyd Mayweather camp, to be able to come on the boxing voice and get that much airplay? Obviously, he's trolling. This dude is motherfucking trolling, dog, and talking about Jesus Christ. Amen. Every, after every time, amen. Jesus Christ, all things to him. Amen. I don't know, man. You know, when I heard them talk about Howard Stern and this is the reason why he blew up, it's okay for you to have some moments in your career as media to have somebody like Maurice Lee comes on and 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 talk about something that may potentially happen and you know the shit that he's talking 
it's like it sounds really good but deep down inside you should make the call and say you know what i'm really giving this cat too much airtime i mean the interview was entertaining it was hilarious but i thought to myself this dude is trolling man he's 28 years old he's only 12 and one and two with five knockouts and to hear him say that um he's gonna go over there and fuck Errol spence up he's fighting in raider stadium and, and check this out. Frame this shit right here. Frame this shit up. He said it's going to be PPV. <laughs> Listen, Errol Spence still owes me gas money for driving up to Texas to see him fight a mandatory who we never heard of before. Fight a mandatory in Carlos Ocampo. He, he owes me gas money. So if you see Errol Spence, right, you know, he's been out. He's been talking. So we can't sit up here and say he's still on the DL, you know, the disabled list and still in recuperation. I need gas money because I, I went up there to, you know, Frisco and, and he, he went in there and, and knocked out Carlos Ocampo. And he, he, he should have learned that if you have that many people on deck in your home, in your backyard, and yellow beezy, you know, walks you out. Guess what? You need to put on a show. You need to give us a little bit more show. And like that, that arena was full of a lot of Texans. A lot of black people was up in there too. I ain't gonna lie. There's a lot of bad women up in there too. I, I'm not gonna lie to you. But Errol Spence owed me some gas money for, for goddamn having us all come to the arena. And he sit up there and knock out Carlos Ocampo in one freaking round. I, I'm my cash app, man. Shit, my cash app is up there, you know, strolling, scrolling uh, across the screen right here. And somebody need to send that shit to Errol Spence. You know what I'm saying? Because I need reimbursement for my gas money. And me, and look, me and my son drove up there to see him fight. I mean, like the crowd was lit. And then Carlos Ocampo landed a one-two combination or whatever. And then all of a sudden, Errol Spence said, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and shut the show down. I really got an after party to go to. Let's get it. And he ended up knocking the dude out, man. I'm like, I'm surprised it wasn't a ride up in there. You know why? Because earlier that night, Harvey F. Fortuna had, had faced, um, God damn. Just had him on the tip of my tongue, too. Just had him on the top of my tongue. Let me see. Um, I can't believe I forgot this dude's name because I actually did an interview with him too. And, and, and apologies go out, man. Once I pull this dude up, I'm trying to think of him without looking him up, though. Damn, what's his name? Danny Garcia just faced him. That's how much he's been out the line. Like, God damn. He's out there in Chicago too, man. Sean Porter faced him. Um, I'm gonna give you his name right quick. Just give me a moment. Damn, that's how long. He, look, that's how long it's been since he he he's he's. I don't even want to use that R word, man. That's gonna that's gonna be fucked up. Damn, why can't I remember this dude's name, man? None of the highlights are showing him facing um, Sean Porter. And he gave Sean Porter, he went the distance with Sean Porter. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to kick myself once I, once I um, pull up this record. Real talk. 
it's gonna be fucked up too. You know, he's out of Chicago, man. Um, he 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 faced Danny Garcia recently, and Danny Garcia was was I think he was the first one to stop him, man. But somehow he's just slipped my memory because I haven't really been thinking about he's been out of sight, out of mind. Unfortunately, Adrian Granados, man, kick myself, man. Adrian fucking Granados. That night we was up there, man. Adrian Granados fought Javier Fortuna and it was a solid fight. And Javier Fortuna want to put on his acting motherfucking goggles, man, and 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 be all theatrical and shit like he was hurt and didn't want to continue. So that fucked up the night. That set the mood for the night. And then Errol Spence go in there and knock out Carlos Ocampo. Yeah, man, that's that's one thing. That's one thing about um, when I hear Javier Fortuna and I heard potentially he was going to face um, Luke Campbell for the vacant WBC. Lightweight title. I was like, mm, you know, Javier, that's a good matchup for him. But which Javier are we going to get? You know what I'm saying? Uh, we, we need the one who faced Robert Easter. We need that Javier Fortuna. We don't need the one who faced Adrian Granados. Because Adrian was putting that work in on freaking Fortuna. And Fortuna pulled a rip card on his ass and jumped off the cliff, god damn it. <laughs> uh, H Money say, Josh Taylor versus Jose Ramirez. Okay. Yeah, they, they they supposed to be um no. Yeah, they're supposed to be fighting for the unification. Yeah. They supposed to be fighting for the unification. That's going to be good though. Who y'all got in that fight? Josh Taylor versus Jose Ramirez, man. Who do y'all have? Be honest, man. Who y'all have winning that fight? I'm gonna tell you who I got. Jose Ramirez. I, 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 that's who I got. Jose Ramirez. I I think he can defeat Josh Taylor. Seriously, I think he can defeat. I'm going with Ramirez. If they ever fight a junior welterweight, I ain't backing down from that. I'm going for Ramirez. Period. I got Ramirez. Because I, like I told y'all, I told y'all Regis Pro Grace wasn't going to win that fight against Josh Taylor. In my opinion, he gets hit too much. Hit too much. He, you know, he need more defense. I mean, seriously. Like, Both of them guys left left the ring with swollen eyes because of lack of freaking defense. Fuck all that getting hit just for the fans and all that. Don't, don't nobody want to have don't nobody want to see that. If you can box, box. But I I, I, I told people I say you know he he gets hit too much and I like how Jose Ramirez box man. I like how he boxes. I think he defeats freaking um Josh. Josh Taylor. Seriously, I do. And I'll stand by that. Maurice Lee is doing a good job getting his um, name out there. And I, I agree with that. You know, I'm not going to lie. It was some times in a sober state that Maurice had me freaking laughing like it was happy hour. I ain't going to lie, man. That dude was funny as shit. And, and the reason why it was so hilarious and, and, and classic it's because he had a response to everything. And he was saying that, look, the only thing you need to do when you're telling somebody something in this day and time, if it's not on TV and it's audio, you have to convince them. You have to convince them. You have to be convincing enough for people to believe it. So if you're talking and you, you have to sit up here and have a delivery to the point of if, if it's total bullshit, you're able to basically express it as if it's absolutely authentic you know what i'm saying and that's what he was doing man he, they was asking him question after question so so champ you, this is Ness. so champ so champ tell me this do you um think 
How much you getting paid? How much you think they, they you're gonna get paid for? I'm getting 10 million. Oh, is that right? 10 million champ? <laughs> I was like, Maurice Lee just say he get paid 10 million, bro. Oh my god, don't you know Adrian Bronner will freaking march on the on the dang showtime steps? He will pull up with something. Adrian Broner would, man, I'm telling you, no one does this shit. No one. No one does trolling better than Adrian Broner on a consistent basis. But I'm going to tell you, man, Maurice Lee is coming in real hot. I'm serious. Maurice is coming real hot on the speed. The shit he was doing on that interview, man, that shit was hilarious, man. Talking about him and his team going to be wearing all white. It's going to be at the Raiders stadium, Raiders stadium. It's going to be on PPV. You know, he's been he's been training. He's going to freaking um, knock Errol Spence out. Um, ask who, who, who contacted him. He said Al Heyman. <laughs> this, this dude right here. It was hilarious, man. I got to give him props, man, because no one trolls better than Adrian Bronner. No one. Tell me one person who trolls. Adrian Bronner just released recently. He said, you know what? <laughs> Adrian Bronner said, Father's Day, I, get, I got two $25 gift cards. From for Benny Hunters, right? Uh, brother said it made me question. <laughs> I got to do better. What he say? I I have I have to do better with with the bitches I nut in or something like that. He said I got to make better choices of the, of the bitches I bust a nut in or, or something like that. Man, that shit was hilarious. Man, he would look. He has what six. I think six or seven kids, I think, with six baby mothers, right? But it's just the fact that Adrian Broner, man, he said that shit with a straight face. He said, I, I got I to do a better job with the with, with who, I, who I nut in or the bitches I nut in or something like that, man. It was hilarious. I ain't going to lie. That, that shit had me rolling, man. But, man, Maurice Lee, if he's indeed trolling at 12 and 1, with five knockouts. Um, I looked at his record previously because I didn't know who the dude was, right? And I just heard he's out there training with Mayweather. He's been putting out looks, short video clips. The first time he came out on his cell phone, he said, you know what? Look, Errol Spence. And you know, he called him a bitch-ass nigga, right? I was like, who is this dude, Maurice Lee, calling Errol Spence a bitch-ass nigga? Like, you know damn well you don't believe none of that shit. So that's when I looked up his record. And I said, man, this nigga, man, he, he, he bullshitting around, right? And then he turned around and said, no, I got to keep it Christian. I got I to gotta keep it faith, you know, and start talking that shit. So I said, okay, man, this motherfucker ain't for real. And then he came out the day on the boxing voice. And I'm telling you, man, this dude has been working. And then even during the interview, his brother said, man, stop bullshit, man. You know you ain't fighting Arrow. And then that's when Ness asked him, like, oh, shit, your brother just fronted you out, man. He just put you, you know, he put you on blast, man. He said you ain't fighting Errol Spence. He said, no, nah, man, he's just trying to, don't believe what he said. He's just out here clowning. But that shit was hilarious, man. I ain't gonna lie, man. I ain't gonna lie. The man, the, the questions that Maurice Lee was given, boxing doesn't have to be serious all the time, but God damn it. When you start trolling like this shit of a well-known fighter like Errol Spence and people don't know what to think, when you're on a legitimate platform as the boxing voice and you up here talking about an interview, potentially fighting Errol Spence, <laughs> this, this brother up here talking about he getting 10 million, dog. He said, we're going to fight in the Raiders stadium. It's going to be on PPV. That's another red flag. I say PPV. Don't nobody know you? Like, how the fuck you going to be on PPV? Don't nobody know you, dog. And then this is another red flag. He says it's going to be for the belts. How? How, dude? 
how Errol Spence is going to come back from a car accident and fight you and put his belts on the line. If anything, that shit should be a non-title fight because you you aren't deserving of a title fight. You know, you're deserving of laughter. You know what I'm saying? Jovial goddamn moments that we can remember and shit, but you're not worthy of a title shot versus Errol Spence. Believe that shit right there. But it was hilarious, man. But I still got to give the edge to Adrian Broner, man. When it all boils down to it, oh, man, nobody holds a straighter face. <laughs> Just like he, he, after his fight with Manny Pacquiao, he said, y'all know I beat that boy. <laughs> Adrian Broner know goddamn where he lost that fight. He say, man, I did it for the hood. Y'all know I beat that boy. I'm like, Adrian, come on, man. You are hilarious, bro. And then, you know, I don't know. I don't know, man. Boxing, it doesn't have to be serious all the time. But when you have individuals that troll a, a, a legitimate a A1 boxing platform, he winning. This dude is winning right now because a lot of people are going to tune in to Maurice Lee better than they did before when he came out with the cell phone, with the, with the mobile phone footage. So they're going to be tuning in for this dude because his, his interview was absolutely hilarious, man. They're going to tune in for this dude, man. If he doesn't go in boxing, if he doesn't make it in boxing, Maurice should try comedy. He should get with some of the names that's out here doing stand-up comedy because it's a changing of the guard that's going on. You know what I'm saying? David Chappelle, Hughley, you know, goddamn Steve Harvey, I'll do it. You know, all, all, all the one, Chris, all them dudes, they, they, they just about, that'd be a perfect time for him, him to say, yeah, let me come over here to comedy. I'm 28 years old. Let me try to start off and do stand up comedy because his shit was hilarious, man. <clears throat> Where they fighting? I have Taylor 50 push up bet on call. Um, you can't fight. Talk like you can. Yeah, that that only works. That only that only works for um a little bit, man. You know, for these some of these fighters, and you know the reason why he's gonna get away with it because there's a lot of people up there in, in Vegas at the TMT that troll online. It's a lot of them. It's a lot. So he's not gonna face serious, you know, serious legitimate vilification for going on the boxing voice. He going to walk back into the gym. They say, man, why you do them like that, dog? Why did you go in there and do them like that? Because from my understanding, he reached out and text Ness and, and they had him on the show. And when he came on the show, that's when he started talking all this shit. Amen. First and foremost, I like to thank my Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. All things through Christ as a amen. And, you know, he started going on this shit. And near the end of the video, he started coming out like, you know, man, hey, whoever that is in the comment section, man, fuck you, Nick. You know, that's when he started kind of like, this dude is on some other shit. You know what I'm saying? Like one minute, you religious, you Jimmy Swaggart. You know what I'm saying? You Creflo Dollar. And then the next minute, you know, you acting like, you know, you don't give a damn about what's coming out your mouth. But D-Ray, um, 50, 50 push-ups um, for a bet. Oh, you going for Josh Taylor? Okay. That's cool. I mean, 50 push-ups, man, is um, I don't even think I lose any 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 breath doing 50 push-ups. Like 50 push-ups, man, like that's over and done with. But 50 push-ups it is, man. Lock it in. We good. We good. No doubt about it. We good. But yeah, man, y'all, y'all make sure y'all tune in to that interview. Let me see something right quick. Let me see how many views it got. And once again, I'm not the person who really worried. About, I want people to tune into my shit, you know, tune into it and, you know, goddamn pay attention. But I'm not, I'm not sitting up here losing any sleep. Let me see the boxing voice. Let me see how many um, views this shit is up to right now. Because it was hilarious, man. <laughs> Tyrone Woodley, 
Tyson Fury just getting mad love over here, man. So, okay. Wow. Oh, he didn't, he didn't goddamn put this shit up there. He didn't post it. He put it private. Smart. Smartness. I like that, man. I like that. Don't give him no shine. I like that. He didn't put the video. He didn't post it. He didn't post the video. He sure didn't. They made some phone calls, goddammit. Hey, Ness and them made some phone calls. And what's fucked up? Now, what they can do, they can edit the video. They can edit this guy out and then post the rest of the video. But the video itself, I'm not sure if it's still out there. Let me read in fine print. Touch for report. Uh, nope. Now, he didn't post it yet. So, therefore, I can look at it like this. They can still edit the video. It won't be as exciting as hearing freaking Maurice Lee go in here and just talk some bullshit. But, yeah, they, they did not post that shit, man. Good on them, man. Good on them. Oh, while, while I'm on here, topics while I'm on here, you know, talking some boxing shit. Jarrell Miller, man. Jarrell Miller and Jerry, Jerry Forrest. I really haven't talked about that shit, but... You know, it, it, they're making the rounds. I really want to get Jerry Forrest and talk to him. You know, very intelligent guy, man. You know, has some, um, he has a really important job that's, um, how you put it? He has a very important job dealing with military. I think he has something to do with the planning process of ships and stuff like that. And come to the fleet, the Navy fleet or what have you. I'm not totally sure. But um, I've kind of listened to a couple of his his interviews and everything. And it's good that he got the call up. You know, I'm not hating on the dude or anything. He's 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 going. Look, this dude obviously respected. You know, he only has three losses and he has 20 KOs, I believe. So for him to get the, the call up and face Jarrell Miller, who's coming off a PED suspension, it's big. I don't look Jerry Forrest should have he should be on every motherfucking interview site getting as much shine as he possibly can. I don't blame him one bit. But this is the only thing I'm looking at. I'm curious to see how Jarrell Miller is gonna look coming off the coming off the pits or whatever and returning to the ring. I'm I'm very curious to see how he looks. Is he gonna have that? That 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 um that gear, those gears to continue to push the gas as the rounds go on and continue to keep up that output. For Jerry Forrest, um, the words and, and what he's explaining, he's very adamant about going in there, giving Jarrell Miller a very competitive fight. He believes he can. He believes he has power enough to go in there and earn the respect of Jarrell Miller. Now, I'm going to tell you from seeing Jarrell Miller. I seen Jarrell Miller in Jersey, right? And um, I actually stopped doing what I wanted to do at media and walked over there when he was taking pictures to, to try to get an interview. You check my YouTube. I'm actually pulling up on Jarrell Miller and it's chaos in there. And I'm surprised I was able to get some audio because it was just mad chaos from Shakur Stevenson, you know, being the hometown guy. But anyway, Jarrell Miller, as you know, he, he's known the, the, the fight over 300 pounds. Easy, right? That's a big dude, man. Jarrell Miller is a big dude. And I don't know what weight Jerry um, Forrest is going to come in at. But anybody who faces Jarrell Miller, it's not like he's a Tyson-esque knockout puncher but but Jarrell Big Baby Miller I know Gerard is coming here talking about he's the real big baby Gerard and much respect bro much respect but I know the fighters that's out here today it's not too many heavyweights out there that's bigger 
than Jarrell Miller. Jarrell Miller used to used to be in the kickboxing too. Like, dude. Jarrell Miller's a big dude. So I'm curious to know how his speed going to look, how sharp he's going to be, and is he going to have the gas tank to push it through the rounds? That's all I'm saying. But I'm, I'm going to definitely try to get Jerry Forrest on here, man. Um, I, I drop you, I drop you a message in your inbox. I haven't heard anything back. And you know, it is what it is, man. Like some fighters, you know, they'll contact you and some won't. So I take it as they come. It's all good. <clears throat> but um, I'm looking forward to that fight. Who else in this? Um, they talking about Wilder twerking. Joshua dismissed by dismissed by the WBC. No undisputed. <clears throat> so. I'm just going through some boxing talking points and I'm seeing out here, right? And, and they saying um, Joshua dismissed by the WBC, no undisputed. So I didn't look, I didn't listen to this one, you know, but the main thing about that whole freaking um, gas session of Tyson Fury coming out and, and with Anthony Joshua and they having a little freaking um, girls not out talking shit talking about they signed a two fight deal then nobody believe that shit you know they they did not believe in that just like Hearns came out and said you know Joshua signed a two fight deal for Wembley and he was going to have some of the biggest names fight on those particular dates and when it came down to the negotiation falling through which they never really intended to fight Wilder back then in 2018 they never intended to they end up fighting Alexander Povetkin when they was in the process of trying to, to, to get Deontay Wilder to fight and they wanted to send him in there with a bag of pennies, he could have just as well fought September 22nd. You know, he was willing to go across the pond, but they just kept on leaving shit out of the contract and just, um, you know, fucking off, basically. And then all of a sudden, the WBA come up with a mandatory and say Joshua needs to face his mandatory within a week or he's going to be stripped. Of course, negotiations somehow halted and it never it never um, progressed any more than that. Give or take, I say a week and a half after that, you hear Hearns coming out. I mean, no, the week that the WBA granted allegedly to Joshua, else he's going to be stripped. That shit came and went. It wasn't they wasn't even signed. No bout was signed within a week. They didn't strip Joshua the WBA title. Nothing happened. And then I say some up uh, some weeks passed by. And then you heard that Anthony Joshua was facing Alexander Povetkin September 22nd and 2018. It's bullshit all the way around. You look at it. Bullshit. So therefore, they come up with this. Joshua signed a two fight Wembley deal. Um, Eddie Hearn come out with a one billion the zone deal. How's that working out right now? <laughs> how's that the zone deal working out doing this freaking shutdown okay so therefore april 13th roll around nobody fight on that card because for one they fucked up everything they're trying to sit up here and structure anthony joshua's opponents to the point to ensure that he doesn't leave i mean doesn't lose but the one fighter that would have made anthony joshua a freaking legend in his own look in the UK, seriously, this would have basically catapulted Anthony Joshua in the silhouette of fighters before him that's over there that's considered Brit fighters. You know what I'm saying? If indeed he would have stepped up to the plate and faced Deontay Wilder and made it a point not to sit up here and make all these stupid ass arrangements and say Deontay Wilder could not come into the ring. He couldn't, they didn't want him in the building and all this other shit. When Deontay Wilder had already been in the building when Anthony Joshua fought Vladimir Klitschko. So for Anthony Joshua to turn the tables and start treating Deontay like he was a field one, he was out in the field working and gathering the cotton. Anthony Joshua was in the house, you know what I'm saying, making sure Massa was good to go. If he wouldn't have played that role and took the fight with Deontay Wilder when Deontay Wilder was hot, Anthony Joshua was hot, 
both of them was undefeated. If they would have basically stepped in the ring around that time, it would have been great because then Anthony Joshua would have solidified that he was a serious heavyweight. He was considered one of the best because if he would have went in there and beat Deontay Wilder while he had the unified titles undefeated, oh man, he would have been undisputed. It would have been nothing you can tell anybody in social media. You couldn't tell no one in the UK. You couldn't tell nobody shit that Anthony Joshua is not the best heavyweight right now. But you know why he didn't make that decision, people? Because he knew Deontay Wilder would have knocked his ass out. Period. I know I got some, I got some um some voices over here that I said Deontay Wilder is still the second best heavyweight. And you know what? You can't sit up here and generalize with some people that's age appropriate adults. Their mindset ain't there. When you tell them some shit, sometimes they actually believe that you wrote it on paper. And that's what you they don't know what a generalization means. If I say I believe Deontay Wilder is the second best heavyweight, that means Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder. I truly believe to this day that Deontay Wilder will knock out Anthony Joshua if they was to fight tomorrow. A healthy Deontay Wilder stepping in there with Anthony Joshua, he stops him. Now, you can't sit up here and debate with me on that going off him stepping in there with Tyson Fury because I believe Tyson Fury would defeat Anthony Joshua the same. So you can't you can't make the point that, oh, what this nigga talking about? It ain't got shit to do with that. It got stuff. It got something to do with you being closed minded and not having the understanding that when somebody else come on there and talk boxing, you need to open yourself up to be able to receive it. Because if Anthony Joshua really wanted to fight Deontay Wilder, he would have did back in 2018. He would have did in 2018. And if by chance he made that fight and he went in there and defeated Deontay Wilder, it would be no fucking question that he was the best heavyweight in the game right now. That's prior to Tyson Fury, any of that. He would have had all the belts. He would have been able to make all the calls and negotiate and do what the hell he wanted to do. But it didn't go down that way. So now you have people talking about Dillian White. And what's disturbing to me is is how Dillian White has been sitting around forever and a day when Deontay Wilder was champion. And he's been trying to be relevant as the mandatory. So now all of a sudden, um, they, they're talking about, well, you know, Tyson Fury might become franchise champion and move Dillian White to WBC. Dillian White has been mandatory riding shotgun for the longest fucking time. And no one's giving this dude. He's the Rodney Dangerfield of boxing. He gets no respect. So to hear a platform sit up here and don't think Deontay Wilder is still a top two heavyweight in the sport, all because he lost. Look, all because he lost to Tyson Fury, who was undefeated, y'all. Tyson Fury is the only one that's been stepping in there with Deontay Wilder. So how are you going to say Anthony Joshua went in there and he touched the canvas multiple times after knocking down Andy Ruiz, but he touched the opponent. You say, oh, he's still better than Deontay Wilder. What the fuck? All, only because he got, look, only because he, he still has the titles. He's still a unified champion because he went in there and fought Caramel Nougat, Snicker, Connoisseur. Andy Ruiz, who was extremely overweight, so he goes in there and looks bad, right? He gets he gets destroyed. People say Anthony Joshua didn't quit. What the fuck did he do? He don't understand English? No Espanol. You know what I mean? I can't speak anything. You know, he's been hitting me up the side of my bloke head, and I don't know what to do anymore. I can't really see left to right. Mike, what's going on here? What's the referee saying? Eddie, where's Eddie? Eddie, where's Eddie? I mean, he's looking around, spit his gum shield out. He don't know what the fuck going on. And you're trying to say Anthony Joshua didn't quit? Anthony Joshua quit. Anthony Joshua, when he was facing Joseph Parker, 
ripped the tape off his fucking gloves because he was fucking tired. Anthony Joshua is known for taking breaks, his own time outs. Just because you sit up here and don't like a fighter's skill set and don't like a fighter doesn't mean your word is born all because you have a personal disdain for a fighter. But yet the neighboring fighters get a pass. The neighboring fighters can do anything they want in the ring. And y'all bum ass fuck boys just sit up here and say, oh, well, Deontay Wilder, you know, he, he always been trash. He always been this. And anybody who support him is fanboys. No, you're the fucking fanboy. And you know who the fuck I'm talking about, too. Y'all the fanboys and y'all are cowards and hypocrites because you would give someone else in a neighboring country who's able to make those mistakes, blatant freaking mistakes, who are overrated, you would allow them to get away with that shit. And then you would allow a neighboring fighter to come over here who's been suspended from the sport, was on coke, ballooned up in weight, should have had that last match before his hiatus turned to a no contest. And y'all giving him a pass because he come back to the sport. And, and, and the only reason y'all want to like him because of Deontay Wilder is the American champ. So you got Anthony Joshua over there who people live vicariously through. They love to live vicariously through Anthony Joshua, right? You want to you want to go over here and allow a man to come to the States and you boo him in his own country. And then, you know, he walks into the MGM Grand and y'all boo him. But yet when he does lose, it, he give you what you want. He loses. You sit up here and make excuses as if it's based all off a of uniform. And Deontay Wilder wasn't fighting. He didn't get up from two knockdowns. He still wasn't throwing punches. Now, look. Check this out. Everybody who support Deontay Wilder isn't fanboys. I'm 50 years old. I'll tell you to your face. I think it's extremely concerning when you have certain fighters that the, that, that have this, um, you can't call it minutia, have this aura with some people that they don't fit the mold to be a boxer. And I'm, I'm saying to myself, like, how deep do they boxing knowledge go? Because heavyweights, you don't really see heavyweight fighters with this perfect boxing technique. You don't see it. Like every heavyweight, they have different boxing styles. Like take David Tour, for instance. People say he didn't have cardio, but he had power, right? You know, he and, and he headhunted a lot. David Tour, he did a lot of headhunting, right? Or you'll get the same people who, who sit up here will glorify Mike Tyson for what he was able to do doing his highlight reels. But then again, they don't think of some of the opponents that he lost to that's considered the bigger names in the sport. And also what he did outside of the ring. He went to prison. You know, he was known for domestic abuse and all that, right? So sprinkle the shit when it comes to Deontay Wilder. He hasn't been a part of any of that. But yet every time someone gets on here and talk about the champ and talk about how his own people, um, you know, excoriate the shit out of him for his skill set, him being a basketball player. And look, I would I would think some type of way about it if I wouldn't experience him. But I can tell you when I was leaving Vegas and the first picture that I got with Deontay Wilder when he was walking with Chris, his security. Right. The first picture I got with him. The lady at the desk asked me, say, who, who are you taking a picture with? Who, what basketball player? What, what team he played on? I said, no, nah, that's heavyweight champ. A heavyweight of what? I said, heavyweight in boxing. And, and, and if I didn't have that experience, then I might feel some type of way about people saying basketball player off the way he looked and what people perception may be. But this woman was a person behind the desk working at the airport. And she asked, who, you know, who's, who's that? Who's a basketball player? So I get what people can say certain things, but in the ring with 42 victories, 41 knockouts, and now one loss, reigned for over five years and was on his 11th defense, you really should check yourself and say, 
You know, am I being reasonable when it comes to booing Deontay Wilder and cheering Tyson Fury, especially in the midst, look, amid of what we've been seeing going on in the protest? Could you imagine if Deontay Wilder was out there, any one of his team out there got caught looting? Um, could you imagine if, look, we even had people up here saying, well, where are the black fighters at? Why the fuck you worrying about black fighters? What does that matter when it comes to something that's globally attached to the media stream right now? Something that's globally affecting us where you have people protesting and rioting across the world. So I had this, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reading and hearing these people say, so what about the black fighters? Why, why the fuck you? You ain't out there in the protest. You're not even out there, to, um, you know, in the, in the midst of the people. It's a lot that I can say. For the people who wasn't out there in the protest, I didn't never put one thing they can say. I didn't, I didn't put that I was going to the protest. I was out there. I did what the fuck I had to do. I didn't put it out here on social media, but I have seen some of y'all, though. You wait till all the shit die down and then you go out there and ain't nobody on the motherfucking street. You maybe got like 15, 20 people. You're not in the midst of the protest. And I don't care. That's you. But when it comes down to you criticizing black fighters and then I'm getting I'm getting to the point of people saying, well, we haven't heard Deontay Wilder speak out. Nigga, you What? Why the fuck you want us? You hear De Deontay Wilder speak out, and y'all up here criticizing the shit out the champ. I'm gonna tell you if the champ look when the champ came back, I'll tell you point blank. If I was him, I wouldn't give the fans no love, man. I just going about my business because at the beginning of the day, and when the sun sets, they don't care. Of course, it doesn't. It doesn't have anything to do with the consensus, the overall hundred percent consensus. But I'm saying the way y'all treated that man when he lost his fucking title, the way you treated him when he was in there fighting in his own country and being booed like that, it's no excuse for that shit. Let me go to the live chat, man. Goddamn Zane. <laughs> What's going on, Zane? Zane said, damn, Jason Maloney is going down like his brother. Oh, my God. Well, check this out, though. Check this out, Zane. Jason already has one loss against Emmanuel Rodriguez. Okay? His brother Andrew was already, look, his brother Andrew was undefeated, bro. 21-0. and Jason Maloney is 20-1. and He already suffered defeat. So I, I don't I don't think it'll bother him as much because he did step in there with a world champion at the time. But for his brother, Andrew, though, to come in here and take that loss against Joshua Franco. Oh, I know he felt some type of way. What's going on, Michael Lewis? Salute, man. <laughs> Jason Maloney is going down like his brother. God damn. Y'all savage, man. Zane getting lit. If AJ get 80 after a loss, what? I'm not sure. Um, if AJ get 80. Okay. I got you. Okay, check this out, D-Ray. Check this out, bro. Okay, you're talking about 80 million. Okay, I got it. Look, when it comes to 80 million, there's no way someone can convince me 80 million is exactly what Anthony Joshua is getting. No one is going to convince me that because the numbers are bloviated and they've been doing this ever since, you know, early times, 2018. Eddie Hearns has always bloviated Joshua's numbers. Always. Let's see the books. Let's see the papers. Let's see all that shit because I guarantee you Eddie Hearns is probably getting 35%. Daddy Hearns is probably getting a percent. He, he might be, he, you look, he might be in some way, shape or form getting paid pretty decent. 
but I have to see. I know for a fact. No. Those numbers over there to make Joshua seem like he's the cash cow and he's the he's the he's the one that's calling the shots. I mean, hey, it happens in boxing all the time. But Joshua is getting paid less money than what they actually advertise. Seriously, he is, man. Uh, AJ Wilder trilogy. Because it made a bill. Totally understand. Check this out again. Solid point that D-Ray. This is what I was trying to say about if Anthony Joshua and Deontay Wilder would have fought. It would have been absolutely big numbers because both of them outside of Tyson Fury was car carrying undefeated. They was carrying O's on their record. And plus, they developed like a history. Like Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder really didn't have that hate and discontent, that legitimate, you know what I'm saying, negative energy, that toxicity that, that boxers can develop from disliking each other. But Deontay Wilder and Anthony Joshua did. Especially during the negotiation process in 2018. They absolutely had that shit. So if they could have potentially made the fight as impossible as it would have been, it definitely would have grossed well over $100 million if by chance Anthony Joshua was built for a trilogy. Now, listen to what I said. If Anthony Joshua was built for a trilogy, Anthony Joshua isn't built for a trilogy, y'all. He isn't built for a trilogy with Deontay Wilder. Tyson Fury is. He proved it. Anthony Joshua isn't. You know why I say that? Because Eddie Hearns would want Deontay Wilder to fight with no rematch. Because the stipulation that Deontay Wilder put on the $50 million is you have to fight me this year. Okay. It has to be in the States and it's no rematch. Because basically he felt like if I'm giving you the bag and that's guaranteed money in escrow and you're set to make another 25 million potentially off the fight, it's going to be on my terms. It's going to be in my backyard. It's going to be where I want it to be. I'm not giving you 50 million and then going over to the UK to fight you. You ain't messing with an illiterate, incompetent individual. So if Eddie Hearns and them would have would have would have been more accommodating to Deontay Wilder and say, you know, well, we give you this percentage and the fighter be over here in the UK. Deontay Wilder was willing to go over there. Cool. But contractually, a rematch. Bring it over to the U.S. Josh was never willing to come over to the U.S. under those circumstances. They didn't want that shit to happen. And if you look at Anthony Joshua's whole, you know, entire aesthetics, his physical physique, he really started to, to dwindle in muscle mass and everything. Once he started to make the move to come over here to the NYC and face Jarrell Miller. And a lot of speculation was that he was coming off some shit. And, and I'm not hating on him. It's not the first time I said it. Look at the way he looked against Carlos Takam. They agreed on 235. Anthony Joshua coming in like 254. Harley any cardio all bulked up looking like freaking a, a model and shit. So when he when he um, when the motherfucking pun dried up over there across the um, across the way. They say you need to go over here if you're going to be a global superstar and you need to go over here to the U.S. and fight in the U.S. That's the only way that you are going to be a global superstar. So, of course, they made sure they fight a name that's pretty decent is Jarrell Miller. Um, I do believe Jarrell Miller would have defeated Anthony Joshua. I, I do believe that he would have did the same shit Andy Ruiz did. He would defeat Anthony Joshua because I always said Anthony Joshua was overrated. So for him to step over here and return and fight Deontay Wilder, if that was the case, it would have put more of a relevancy to Anthony Joshua as a fighter over there across the pond and over here in the U.S. Because, look, it takes a lot more for Eddie Hearns to come over here in the streets of NYC and ask random individuals that he selected previously to say, um, excuse me, do you know Deontay Wilder? 
Who is he? Is he um is he a baseball player? Um, excuse me. Do you know Deontay Wilder? Um, who, who, who is that? Is he a, a basketball player? It, it, it seemed too premeditated for the viewing audience to basically accept it as being realistic. So for Eddie Hearns to come over here and ask all these people, do you know who Deontay Wilder is? A bloke. Do you know who the bloke is? I mean, come on, man. Nobody failed for that shit. The question should have been. Have y'all heard of Anthony Joshua? And they would have said, who the fuck is that guy? That's what they would have said. Who's the fuck is that guy? Like Conor McGregor said to, to Jeremy Stevens, who the fuck is that guy? Don't nobody know Anthony Joshua over here like that. And what makes it so bad, U.S. fans are sit up here and dog out a champion who's being the people's champ, he's in a, he's interacting with his fans. He's talking to people. He's getting, you know, doing interviews. He's doing bomb squad all the time, right? But people still want to talk about how his legs look, how his, how his technique is, and how how bad he look on a freaking um in the ring in a fight, right? But check this out though. This is this essentially is the most important part. Don't nobody know Anthony Joshua over here. Don't nobody know that that guy. They don't know him like they know um, Deontay Wilder. For Anthony Joshua to come over here to NYC and have his media surrounding him and disallowed media like myself and others who could potentially been in NYC to ask Anthony Joshua certain questions, the hard questions. He would have been more respected if he allowed himself to bleed over into the hearts of those boxing fans over here in the U S to get an understanding that, Hey, he's willing to, to talk to the YouTubers. He's willing to talk to these other media resources that's that's on here on YouTube that's a little bit higher than us. He's willing to, to put himself out there, but he never did it. Everybody that was surrounding Anthony Joshua when he came over here for the press conference, when Jarrell Miller was disrespecting him, he never had the, 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 the common media sources that's right here in place in the backyard come up and talk to him. You're not a king. You're not a king like that. You're not royalty. You can't come over here and say you're going to be a global superstar, but yet you don't want to talk to nobody except ESPN. It's not going to fucking happen. You got to talk to the branches. You know what I'm saying? You got to talk to the branches that's out here in the media. You got to give us a shot. You got to allow yourself to be subjected to the good and the bad questions. And Anthony Joshua never did that. So for people to say that no one knows Deontay Wilder in the States, you got to know him. You know why? Because you talk about them all the time in a negative fucking way. You boo them in the Staples Center. You got to know who you booing. You boo them in the MGM Grand so you know who the fuck he is. <clears throat> but AJ ain't built for a trilogy. Believe that shit. Who has, look, who has he fallen in a trilogy? Who? They can say Deontay Wilder fought Tyson Fury twice, right? And then whenever the fight comes back around at the end of this year, if it does, he'll have a trilogy on that. We're not going to pronosticate the outcome. It is what it is. It was momentum coming off the first fight. Controversial. Went into the second fight. Controversial. It hit me out. Controversial to the point where the towel was thrown in by his corner. Period. Controversial because Deontay was knocked down twice in the fight. He's bleeding out of his left ear. Fat lip. Tyson Fury was freaking... You know, leaning on him, 273, using every bit of weight, but he boxed. He had a, a he had a dirty but solid game plan. His tactics was absolutely to be enforced in the most aggressive way, period. And 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 Tyson Fury did that against Deontay Wilder. So you can't really sit up here and say, you know what, that's culpability of Tyson Fury for being a dirty fighter. Yeah, he was fighting dirty. 
and no one did anything about it. Kenny Bayless didn't do shit about it. He didn't, he didn't, he took a point. What? When did he take a point? What? Fifth, fifth round? Something like that? Sixth round? He took a point. But come on, man. Um, the towel was thrown in and Deontay was still swinging. And it is what it is. We have to go back to the trilogy and see what the fuck happens at the trilogy. In the meanwhile, though, y'all do me a favor. Um, for the media outlets that's out there, I know some of y'all probably peeking in through the window. You continue to, to keep, you know, Deontay Wilder's name relevant by telling the audience everything he doesn't do right. Right. And what you're going to do is continue to get more people to tune in once he does come back to the surface and make his presence known. Um, people will feel a little bit more different now. You know why they're going to feel different? Because he does have a loss on his record. He does have a loss. Now that he has a loss on his record and he doesn't have the belt anymore, it's a lot of people aren't going to be as sensitive to come out here criticizing Deontay Wilder. You might find a little bit more supporters this time around when he's stepping there against Tyson Fury. Mark my word on that. Watch. Because if y'all going to give Tyson Fury this, this waiver – they come up and talk shit all the time and sit up here and say, well, I want to uh, I want to let everybody know I signed a two fight deal with Anthony Joshua. Well, guess what? You haven't fought Deontay Wilder and um, completed your contractual obligation yet. So you got to step in there for a trilogy and face the former WBC champion. Deontay goes in there and get his belt back. What is the conversation and energy going to be from the boxing people now? What you going to say? It was luck because there's no other. Look, after this trilogy, it's done for both of them. Deontay get his belt, but it, Tyson Fury isn't his next fight. Tyson Fury take the belt. Everybody, you know, panties are getting nice and moist. You know what I'm saying? And you and those of you that sit up here, oh Joshua, oh Joshua, oh how we love Joshua. Maybe we can see a Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua um unification. That's what a lot of people are looking for, but it's not because it's boxing, it's because they don't like Deontay Wilder. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's not because it's boxing, because if it was boxing, you would break down each fighter equally. You would say what what's good and bad, plus and minus of Deontay Wilder, plus and minus of Tyson Fury, and plus and minus of Anthony Joshua. Don't talk about Anthony Joshua as if he don't have a suspect confetti pack chin. Him and Amir Khan have the same DNA when it comes to freaking neurological deficiencies, which cause them to lose consciousness right when the glove touches their chin. That's fact. That's fact. And then you can talk about Tyson Fury. He's been down on the canvas, too. And that's what I'm saying is so hypocritical because Deontay Wilder drops Tyson Fury in the first fight twice. And then he drops Deontay Wilder two times in the, in the, in the rematch. And people are acting like Tyson Fury never been on the, on, on the canvas before he fought Deontay Wilder the first time. Y'all not being realistic, man. Y'all sitting up here, um, you know, being extremely ex parte. You know, really acting, you know, like seriously, you know, you you, you meant the, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You act like you blind to the fact that you're being extremely over biased and sensitive to not just calling down the middle. You're not being true reporters. You're basically saying, you know what? I'm just going to have a group of people and I'm going to talk shit about Deontay Wilder. You got to keep it down the middle, man, out of respect. Um, P. Scott, as we said immediately after the second fight, the, the people booing while it was downright shameful. Yeah, I, I agree there, uh, Mike. I agree. That's all I'm saying. And, you know, people place this label on certain media, black media, right? That if you support um, a black fighter, you're just a fanboy. And not only that, you have a lot of black individuals that will sit up here and put the same placement just because they're the ones that's talking shit about Deontay Wilder. So they won't sit up here and just be grown as men. But in a pack of puppies, don't expect to get a wolf. 
You know what I'm saying? You got a bunch of puppies just congregating together. They all going to sound the same. They're going to whine alike and they're going to move when each other move. That's off their narratives. That's off everything they say. That's how they're going to move. They're going to co-sign off everybody's shit within the group of puppies. But when a wolf roll up on the scene, that's when they get all agitated, disgruntled, and they want to say, you don't know shit about boxing. No, no, it's not even that. It's not even that, man. When a motherfucker cut that shit down the middle, I'm not going to support just black fighters because I'm black. I'm not going to support this fighter because I like it. I am reporting on the combat sports in general. So y'all need to get on board. Don't sit up here and give motherfucking passes to Tyson Fury just because he's a neighboring fighter. But yet you won't give any passes to Deontay Wilder. He ain't never been locked up. You want to talk about the man, how many kids he got, but yet you don't want to speak about how he started boxing for his daughter. The amount of jobs he had before he went into boxing, the short stint that he had before going into the Olympics and earning a bronze medal. But yet Tyson Fury goes out here and cheat the system and, and, and get addicted. Come back with a mental illness title storyline and y'all suck that shit up. And, and, and that just that just goes to show you how much credit I place on some people in their maturity, because um, you're pretty much blinded sometimes and just making grown grown people decision and say, you know what? What's right is right. And what's wrong is wrong. Now, you come up here and say Tyson Fury is good. He had a mental illness. No, you full of shit. He was on drugs. He chose to him and his him, him and his cousin, Hughie, both was on drugs and he cheated the system. So really, the fight he had against Klitschko, it should be a no contest, period. And then he was actually caught in a, in a, in a, in a situation that, um, you know, with the hammer fight, that allegedly it looked like he was cheating. But I, that's not for me to get into. I'm just saying, you know, motherfuckers out here getting passes. And y'all not being fair. Y'all making yourself look stupid. And just because you want to say bitch ass nigga, bitch. Man, we heard that shit before. Get the fuck out of here with that, man. When a person sitting up here, look, I would never use a lot of energy calling another man names and vulgarities and obscenities and all that shit if I don't know him. And then turn around and tell my... Oh, he's just a fanboy. He just started watching boxes. You never saw any work I did or nothing, right? And then finally you go on my YouTube and you find out who I was able to interview and talk to. You still want to act like, well, let me check his views. It's not about the views, bro. It's all about you actually taking the effort to go out here and talk to these people. Getting in contact with them by all means necessary. Talk to them. If you enjoy and love the sport, get in contact with these legends. Get in contact with the grassroots fighters, the up and coming fighters. Show respect to the ones that's trying to get it and grinding out. If you got a fighter that you reported on, they got knocked out. But guess what? You go back to it and show respect. If you ain't never interviewed a fighter and all you do is sit on here and make videos all day, how can you downplay and devalue what I've done? Just off social media, you know, and sitting on your ass and getting with a group of puppies and all y'all eating out of the same bowl, sniffing each other's ass and say, yeah, he part of the group. Yeah, he, he part of the group. He smelled just like he's, he, he, he part of the group. Come on, man. Alphas don't do that shit. When Lou Garou roll up on the scene, and he, ain't, he ain't worrying about no motherfucking puppies. Believe that shit. <clears throat> he said Franco beat Maloney convincingly. I agree, man. It was a good fight. And you know what? Um, Franco came in there with a different type of energy. And I'm looking at I'm looking at Maloney, and I'm saying to myself, like, this is his first fight in the U.S. You know, he's coming here to, to the U.S. with no crowd and everything. How's this dude feel? Because over where he was fighting at, you know, he probably felt comfortable. You're always going to feel comfortable in your backyard. 
what I'm saying? So for him to come over here, undefeated record, it, it was a lot of pressure on that dude. And then for him to get dropped in the 11th round, oh, I know he felt like shit. I know he felt like shit. I know his corner was trying to boost him up and trying to trying to get him to another level, but it's tough, man. This is combat sports. It's tough. Like a championship fight, bro. And you get dropped in 11 and, and you don't know if the fight close or not. Give it up to Joshua Franco, man. I ain't going to lie. It was a good fight. <clears throat> hey, sh shout out to you, um, D-Ray. See you next time, man. Peace and blessings. What we need is cut you teaching tonight. I agree. Hey, salute to you always, man. Thanks for dropping through. Abraham Nova um, fought two bombs. <laughs> Zane is goddamn, goddamn hitting it hard. He ain't showing no mercy. Zane is merciless tonight. He's coming here with the with the goddamn Thor hammer, swinging that motherfucker. Bye. Shoot. Michael said half the people dissing Wilder or calling anyone who isn't sucking Fury's balls a fanboy has such a clear bias that their opinions are invalidated by their own actions and words. And I couldn't say it better, man. That's true words right there, man. Because it's, it's, a, it's a distinct stigma and label placed on um, black supporters, period, that no one really doesn't want to talk about. They don't want to talk about the shit. And, and I wouldn't even be mentioning this if I didn't have an experience. And I don't have to sit up here and bloviate or exacerbate anything. But I had someone that's real big in the promotion side of the house come up to me and tell me, let me ask you, son. Um, I know Wilder's your boy. I said, Wilder's not my boy. In order, First of all, <laughs> as a grown man, as a grown man, I never, I never, I can say I just never hung with boys Anyway, I mean, solo dolo for a minute, right? In order for me to consider Wilder so-called a boy, I will have to have some type of intermediate um, interaction, break bread with him, um, be at the club, have, be able to have a cordial conversation with him off, off topic, outside of boxing, you know, have some type of um, decent relationship, communication. For him to be known him for years, for even him to be considered a friend, you know what I'm saying? In that, you just don't call a person a friend just because you see them and it's somebody you respect for what they do. You know what I'm saying? A friend in my, you know, in, in my interpretation, somebody you know on a personal level, rather than professional level too. But they are quick to say black media, in a sense, if you support black fighters. You're a fanboy. And then on this social media platform, they want to associate you. With, they want to associate you with a certain group. Now, when you're out here doing this shit on your own, then they find other variables to link you to certain negative situations. Because a lot of a lot of these cats are basically covering the sport as a group of individuals and not individual, not a single entity. They're grouping up to basically, um, you know, get their energy out there to expand their presence out here in the boxing community. When you're doing it by yourself like me, they want to say you don't know shit about boxing because you're not reporting on boxing in general. And, you know, you'll never forget me. You'll never get me to understand anything about that. You know, you'll never get me to digest that other than what a salt tablet is. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's just not for me to do, y'all. Well, we need to stop sitting up here covering just specific fighters every day because you have other people like you would sit up here and glorify Stephen A. Smith for what he does when he report on multiple sports. But yet, just because you have the capability of reaching out to me or somebody else that's doing the same thing I'm doing individually, you would say, oh, so-and-so. They don't know shit about this. 
or they don't know nothing about that. But Stephen A. Smith, Max Kellerman, they report on multiple, multiple genres of sports, whether it's boxing, whether it's football, basketball, multiple genres. It's not because they're on ESPN. It's because they have did enough due diligence and research and educated themselves to place them to place them in that position to be in front of the TV screen. So if you get somebody that's covering boxing and MMA, don't sit up here and denigrate them and say they don't know shit about boxing because I don't talk about the same boxes every other day. Errol Spence, Deontay Wilder, Terrence Crawford. Terrence Crawford, Errol Spence, Deontay Wilder. Come on, man. Why y'all ain't talking about Sean Porter, man? <laughs> Why y'all ain't talking about Sean Porter? And black fighters shouldn't be should be feeling some type of way either if you don't have a media outlet that say, oh, well, we, we want to support black. We support just that's not what the sport is, that's not what media is about. You got to report on all the fighters. Period. Some of y'all just don't want y'all just don't want to do anything, man. Zane can't go three with these bombs. Hey, I, I'll true, man. Hey, I, hey, that's true. Hey, shout out to Denise Ward in the building, man. Thanks for dropping in. It's always a pleasure seeing you um, drop in. Boxing queen in the building. But yeah, that's that's the way I look at it, man. Michael. Um, you know, he made he made a very solid summation, man. You know, like these neighboring fighters get passes when, you know, the black fighters in the U.S. especially. It's a lot of black fighters in the sport of boxing. It's a lot of black fighters in sports in general. So you will get people who who have seen it and they will refuse to get that 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 fighter a chance. So they criticize them. If they don't fit the um, the template, so to speak, because boxing doesn't have a template. It has a visual assessment that people want to associate and say, yeah, this is the what I would like to see in a boxer. But boxing doesn't have a template. You know why? Because every opponent is different. So it's no way boxing can have a template because some fighters fight with their hand down and some fight with their hands up. Every, you know, every fighter throw the hook differently. You know, some might step into it and some, you know, on the count, some, you know, fighters have their own strength and weaknesses. It's no template to how you're going to go in there and fight this opponent. Now, it may be certain areas that we look forward to seeing. Like we knew Mike Tyson was going in there for the knockout. We know his hook to the body and his uppercut up the middle. That shit was crucial. You know what I'm saying? We know Larry Holmes had one of them superb jabs. We do. We, we can pick and choose a lot of people that have great characteristics. We can say Roy Jones is one of the quickest fighters ever to grace the square. You know what I'm saying? We can we can be enamored and admire Floyd Mayweather's tactical defensive mastery, his boxing mastery as an overall complete fighter, taking less damage as possible. Even outside of the Shane Mosley and Marcus Maidana fight. You know what I'm saying? I mean, hey, even with Miguel Cotto. Miguel Cotto fight. You know, he was able to do something that the fighters haven't been able to do. But when it comes down to this media shit, what I'm trying to tell you is that you can say somebody don't know shit about boxing all you want. Just because they talk about mixed martial arts, you have to really understand, like, are you limiting yourself to combat sports? Because the more I learn about mixed martial arts, the more it improves my understanding about boxing, too. And the more I learn about boxing, it improves my understanding of mixed martial arts. Because when you see certain boxers cross over the mixed martial arts, you see where they might be deficient in certain areas. You know what I'm saying? I got to give it up to Heather Hardy. I have to give it up to Amanda Serrano. I've seen Heather Hardy cross over to mixed martial arts and get her ass handed to her and still keep on fighting with a busted nose. You know, I've seen Amanda Serrano cross over to mixed martial arts. Seven division champion, not that good. 
in mixed martial arts, but in boxing, she's a, she's a freaking legend. You know, she's a future Hall of Famer. But people need to understand, you know, just because um, they're two different sports and you are consistent with one sport, you can't knock someone that's consistent with, you know, basically educating themselves on a variety of combat sports, a variety, knowing the language in mixed martial arts from the strikes that they throw with their hands and, and legs to understanding the very complex part of BJJ, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, how the whole course works, everything about that muddy flats. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it is an amazing encyclopedia, man. I mean, and it's a lot that I don't know because I don't train it like that. So when I'm doing research and reading up on it and going to these schools and, and looking at these people train in mixed martial arts, it is indeed a, um, a curriculum. You have to go ahead and learn what the fuck you are watching. It's amazing. Boxing is amazing. That's why it's called the sweet signs. Mixed martial arts is amazing. You know, the time I went over there to Thailand and, and went able to um, I was able to um, visit a Muay Thai school and I saw the way those kids looked, those young kids, it would be considered child abuse over here. The shins of these kids, what they was being forced to do over there. No wonder they the way they are when they grow up, how tough those um, Thai, Thai kids are. They extremely tough. The Fili Filipino kids. We hear people say all the time, you know, I, I, I got it from the mud. I got it from the mud. Yeah, it's a lot of us that, that that was living in poverty growing up. Real talk. But I actually went over to mud from Manila and, and, and the Philippines in the 90s. I saw mud. I saw how bad and how the huts they was living in. I mean, it was bad. It was fucked up. I ain't going to lie. The bud hate hurts me just because he's not advised by. <clears throat> when I see people um, criticizing Bud, right? This was I. This was I think about it, and it's just my mentality. I think of it in the same instance as Wilder, because a lot of people would criticize Bud for having a very dense resume in welterweight division. And if they was smart enough, they wouldn't be comparing Bud's resume to Errol Spence's in the welterweight division, because Bud most recently moved up there and fought Jeff Horn. Okay. I'm not talking about recently a couple of weeks because you got to be clear. Motherfuckers can't generalize shit, right? They said, they are that he, he up here saying most recently, whenever he chose to move up to welterweight division, the first person he fought was the champion. He, he stopped him. And then he went on to face some other names. Errol Spence has been campaigning that this division forever in a day. So for him to, to end up going into the backyard of Kell Brook and picking up the IBF title, that is respect. That is absolutely respect that I always have for Errol Spence being a dog. For him to go over there and be behind and take, I mean, I'm talking about being a motherfucking firefight with Kell Brook and end up stopping him. And end up stopping him. That's, that's shit. That's the kind of cloth Errol Spence is cut from, right? You see Bud, three division champion. As we was talking earlier, people will always criticize who Bud fought in the three division championship. But it's the point, and what are you looking at in the sport of boxing right now? You're looking at fighters not even trying to defend a strap. They are just trying to get, they're just trying to make moves. If they are able to go get another paycheck over here and fight, they will. If they're able to go get another belt at this particular and the opponent fit their nomenclature correctly, they'll go do it. No one's really trying to unify a division right now. Seriously, if that was the case, Lomachenko, who had every belt besides the IBF title, which was currently um, being um, held by Richard Comey, all he had to do is wait for Teofimo Richard Comey winner. And then we would have had an undisputed title. But people saying, well, 
Vasily Lomachenko vacated the motherfucking WBC so he won't have to face Devin Haney. And as I asked before, I asked some people, I say, why do you give Vasily Lomachenko so much credit? Look at his resume. Yeah, he's a three division champion, but you glorify Vasily Lomachenko, who's 14 and one, I believe, right? But yet for Crawford, He's a three division champion, has over 30 um, wins, and you criticize him for who he fought to become the undisputed champion. But yet and still, he's also criticized for not talking to the media, which I salute him for. I mean, not so much when I want an interview. <laughs> I, I salute you. I'm glad you didn't give me an interview, man. But I totally get it, man. Like I said, I totally, because I was the same way. I totally understand why Crawford. Refuse to talk to the media, y'all, because he he probably feel they don't appreciate it. But you know what I respect about Crawford, though? Like I respect about Deontay is the fact that these brothers, especially I, I've seen Crawford more so. Not seen them just about the same, but I've seen Crawford with more. Um, He's always with his family. Always. Always with his family. Always, man. You know, always talking about black fathers ain't in the household. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you, you hear it all the time, but I'm telling you. Nothing you can tell me about Crawford. You can say what you want and, you know, he don't talk to media. I don't. Who cares? The man is always with his family when you see him on deck at a boxing match. Always. He's with his, his cousins. He, he, he with somebody. He definitely has his wife there. He, he has some of his kids and his mom might be there. You know what I'm saying? But you always see him with his family. Always. Deontay, you see him with his, with his peeps, his girl, talking to the people. You know, I've seen Deontay on several occasions, man. Down here in Atlanta, up in Alabama, at a regional card where he was a guest. And he shut it down and basically stayed there and did interviews. He didn't have five or six, seven foot motherfuckers around him. He just had one piece of security, you know, one person of security. And he's up there talking to people and to the lights, you know, to, to the damn place was almost empty. You know what I'm saying? You got to respect that shit. But, you know, I never sit up here and say, well, I'm going to jump on a group of puppies and, and, and whine about the same fucking thing that, you know, you got a champ right here in your own backyard. And who knows how long it's going to take to see another heavyweight champ. I'm talking about with the super titles. Because it's going to be a long time, y'all. But right now, what I, what I hope happens is that I hope sooner or later Crawford is able to go in there and Errol Spence and get this fight. I really hope this fight happens sometime in 2021-22 um, because both of them in their 30s. And then also, I hope the fight go down between Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury for the trilogy. And I really hope that um, those individuals who are being those little newborn puppies who like smelling each other's ass all the time, to see who's going to bark first so you can goddamn chime in. I hope you understand what you're saying, that just because someone support a black fighter, it doesn't, it doesn't um, place them... And the category of being a fanboy. When you can't have a dialogue with another man, you should check yourself in the mirror. You're like, a lot of y'all motherfuckers can't have a dialogue with a grown ass man. You got to have a group of people. So when a wolf pull up to your platform, it's a lot of you motherfuckers out there that's soft as wet panties. You can't have a dialogue with a grown ass man because that's something, that's the energy you don't want. You don't want that energy. You want to be around some individuals that can boost you up and give you courage and goddamn warm your little freaking shallow, you know, um, masculinity. Not everybody built like that. This social media shit got motherfuckers just pumped up. It's a lot of motherfuckers do construction work with their fingertips on this bitch. Back in the day, construction workers was somebody who was on the street and they was building, tearing down, and they was really putting in the hard labor. And then you got motherfuckers got them on here and they really got them wearing out the home keys in this bitch. ASDF, 
Y'all motherfuckers are really tight with the home keys. Your pinky is really strong. Y'all got some strong ass pinkies, goddamn it, pressing enter. Seriously. I'm a pro black and hate on the um, undisputed and two time unified black father on young brothers. Um, undisputed and two time <laughs> unified black father on young brothers. Of, I'm not sure what you mean by that, um, D Ray. I can't train but call them bums. If you're talking about other people who call them bums, yeah, I totally agree, man. Um, I don't call fighters bums. Um, I would say they're less competitive. Everybody have their own thing. I've, I've heard fighters call each other bums, but they're the ones in the ring. But I myself, I don't really, I, I don't call fighters bums. I just have a different respect, having trained a little bit in, in martial arts and, and combat sports. And, um, you know, just the overall respect for the fighters going in there taking punishment, you know, but um, social media is a different little animal. You know what I'm saying? You got to groom these little puppies. You got to you got to not stay in the area too long, man, because the longer you stay in the area, the louder they talk and it don't mean anything. You know, it's just all them together, man. They just used to that same energy. Puppies. One thing you know about puppies, they feed off each other's energy. They do. So really, if you're not used to talking that type of dialogue, having that type of dialogue with someone that's used to being in a group setting, then you might be extremely disappointed. So, so don't go back to the kennel. Because if you want to have a conversation with a bunch of puppies, man, this shit might be a bit goddamn um, distorted for you. You know what I'm saying? It, it might be considered um, a cacology or whatever. I told the motherfucker to stop P U L I N G. I said, stop pulling. And they say, stop pulling. Motherfucker, what the fuck you talking about pulling? I mean, come on, bro. Come on now. But man, that's all I get. I, I, I know somebody jumped on here earlier, but he never came back. He never returned. I can't help you out, bro. I mean, I. Hey, shout out to um, H Money, man. I don't know you that well or whatever, but he told them the, um, you know, don't come on somebody else's platform. I won't come on somebody's platform and, and start talking about the miscellaneous stuff because I do visit other people's platform periodically, sometimes, but I, very limited that I will say anything. I will say anything. But when you jump on there and, you know, you have a pack of puppies. And they all want to talk and yep the same way. And you're like, man, it's all respect, man. I come in respect. And then they just keep on yapping. And you got one big mouth and, and, and you and you listen to this cat and you say, damn, you must have had it real bad right when you was, you know, introduced to life because your mouth is so fucking big and no one's believing anything you're saying. How can you just go up here and just yep, yep, yep. And, and all the other people around you aren't telling you, hey, man, stop putting so much energy into somebody you don't know. You know what I'm saying? You're talking to a grown man, potentially, you know, just chill, talk about boxing, talk about MMA and just let it go. That's all you have to do, man. You got a lot of people that's on these keyboards and it's something about these home keys, man. They got motherfuckers just powered up. It remind me of mystical. You can't talk boxing with them. You can't talk nothing. You can't have a dialogue or anything. <clears throat> Times have absolutely changed. But, but, but don't let it change who you are, though. And don't, don't get mad at individuals on here that's used to being in a group setting and, and carrying on the conversation all the time. I mean, let them do what they got to do. That doesn't mean you have to jump in and, you know, if a motherfucker come at you different and they used to being around other four or five motherfuckers and not used to walking alone, then expect that type of energy. A motherfucker start yapping together and goddamn got to be all nice and cozy and shit, rubbing up against each other. I mean, understand what the group you in, you know what I'm saying? 
always live by these words no expectations no disappointment especially when it comes to talking a sport of combat no expectations no disappointment you don't expect shit from them you won't be disappointed so don't stay over there too long and i'm gonna get up out of here from that i appreciate everybody for stopping through you know what i'm saying i look forward to um I might be back. <laughs> I might be back on here for um, the fight card. You know, this was catch weight episode seven sixteen, and um, before I um, get up out of here, let me just check some stuff. Okay, this is what I wanted to say. The um, the numbers for Franco Maloney, <clears throat> Joshua Franco, and Andrew Maloney, ESPN peaked at three hundred ninety thousand viewers average 310,000 that's what I was trying to get back to so you know that's that's the views that tuned into that fight um and I'm seeing I hear Tyson Fury um vows to hire Breland if Deontay Wires fire him if Deontay Wilder fire him and and this this is what I want to be clear about right This this is what I'm trying to explain the pusillanimous mentality of certain individuals. They continue to let Tyson Fury get away with doing fuckboy type shit. It is. He, Joshua come over here and say he'll help Tyson Fury train for Deontay Wilder when Anthony Joshua can't even de defeat Deontay Wilder, right? Tyson Fury get up here and announces that him and Joshua is is a sign a two fight deal, and then he he says he'll hire Breland. If Deontay Wilder fires him. Now, what do you think? Check this out. What do you think Mark Breland is going to gain if he changes over and help Tyson Fury? Even though it's already speculation, a lot of the freaking rumor mill about certain inside dealings going on with this situation with the camp and Mark Breland, right? I'm not gonna get on, I'm not gonna get into it because I respect Mark Breland. It ain't none of my fucking business unless he tell me about it himself. But if Tyson Fury hires Mark Breland for Deontay Wilder, this is when I hold the media platforms that I'm I'm they're supposed to be my constituents or my compeers. I hold them accountable. If you're not willing to say Tyson Fury is a fucked up individual. For going in there, competing the way he did in the rematch, right? Competing the way he did in the rematch. But then he gets on here and says he needs Mark Breland. Why? You won the fight, right? So you get on here and say you're going to go in here and smash Deontay Wilder's head in again. And then it's going to be on to Anthony Joshua. That's if he get past his mandatory, right? But I probably won't hear too many people talk about Tyson Fury and what he said about potentially hiring Mark Breland if Deontay Wilder fires him. That, again, is basically treating somebody like they're stupid. You're basically saying, let me use Mark Breland, who's a black trainer for a black heavyweight fighter, and let me bring him over, him over here with us as if he has no loyalty. You know what I'm saying? I don't think Mark Breland would do something of a sort, but you never know in the sport of boxing. But if Tyson Fury is in the, you know, in the conversation of so many media people that sit up here and gives him so much credit as being the first, I mean, the number one heavyweight. I want you to talk about this. I want you to talk about this shit right here. I want you to talk about him potentially hiring Mark Breland if Deontay Wire fires him. Talk about how how fucked up that is. If you won the rematch in the seventh round. And, it, and you was able to get the stoppage. Why would you need Mark Breland? That's showing you how much of a snake Tyson Fury is, period. If he's willing to go up here and scoop up and say, you know what? Let's go out to, let's go out to eat. No, 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 no. I got to get my Tyson Fury. <laughs> Tyson Fury always seemed like he got down, had motherfucking the swine flu mixed in with bronchitis. Let's go out there. 
smart breathing. Let's go get something to eat. Because you want to eat, we can tell me all the secrets, Deontay Wilder. If Deontay Wilder's skill set is as fragmented as people say it is, right? What does Mark Breland has to teach if Tyson Fury has already defeated Deontay Wilder and stopped him in seven rounds? Why would you even put this shit out here? Why would you even want to, you know, lure yourself to say, I will hire Mark Breland? What is Mark? It, look, this is why I'm telling you, you know, I'm not going to hear the media platforms talk about it because they love, they, they, they sit up here and they want to goddamn boost up Tyson Fury. Why would you want to hire the trainer of a fighter who you said was depleted in fundamentals before Tyson Fury stepped in the ring with him? It makes absolutely no sense. Why would you want to hire a trainer who basically, in your, in your opinion, never taught Deontay Wilder anything of importance to deal with the basic fundamentals of boxing while he was stepping in there with Tyson Fury two times. What possibly could Mark Breland tell Tyson Fury about Deontay Wilder when you have already successfully lifted the title from him? What are you going to tell him? Um, personal conversations that, that was had? It wasn't no personal conversation Deontay Wilder had after the Tyson Fury fight. Deontay didn't get with Mark Breland and tell him his most deepest, darkest, freaking emotional moments of losing his title. I can guarantee you that. He didn't talk to Mark Breland about that shit. So if Deontay Wilder is this fighter who doesn't have any skills as a boxer, what is Mark Breland going to tell um, Tyson Fury, who has basically said Deontay Wilder doesn't have the skills so it makes no, it makes absolutely no sense. But you know what? You're not going to hear too many of the um, the media platforms talk about it. They're not going to say anything about it because it doesn't interest them. But if it was Deontay Wilder trying to hire Sugar Hill, then they would be all up on here. All the puppies would come out to play. Shitting all over the place. Eating their own shit and talking shit. You know what I'm saying? Oh, why Deontay Wilder want to hire Sugar Hill? That's what he needs to go in there and beat Tyson? Come on, y'all wouldn't goddamn lay off that man if he would have here and he would have put that shit out here in the media. He want to hire Sugar Hill. He don't care what the cost is. We need to hire Sugar Hill to go in here and win this trilogy. Y'all motherfuckers wouldn't even give Deontay Wilder any breathing room. Y'all would be on here and putting in parentheses Oh, so-and-so fires back at Deontay Wilder hiring Sugar Hill. Deontay Wilder, no confidence, hire Sugar Hill. Wilder needs to quit the sport of boxing. His team is out of control. I mean, it would be so much shit if Deontay Wilder said he wanted to hire Sugar Hill to prepare him for the trilogy. He don't care what the cost. We offer Anthony Joshua 50 million. We, we're freaking offer Sugar Hill, you know, amount of money to appease him so he can come in here and train us and tell us everything to beat Tyson Fury. Y'all, y'all not gonna man up to do that shit, man. Y'all ain't y'all ain't cut like that. Y'all hot cheese, man. What I don't know, you know what I'm saying? What I don't know about Mark Breland, what I do know and don't know, I, I refuse to talk about. <laughs> what I've heard and, and stuff like I refuse to put out there. Y'all not hitting me up on my inbox I'm talking about what, I, what I've been told. I just let those people who, who basically the sources, I just let them have their in their, in their confidence, and that's it. It's not for me to talk about. Because you just can't go up here and, and when motherfuckers say you don't know nothing about anything, you can't tell them, you know, conversations and try to prove shit. I'm not out here to prove anything to any other person. But, you know, what I do know about that particular situation, I'm just going to keep to myself because, you know, out of respect, it's, it's not even up to me to sit up here and talk about it. 
But it's up to Deontay Wilder and his team, JDs and all them. I'm pretty sure they'll make the right decision. <laughs> because once again, why does Tyson Fury need to hire a coach of a fighter that they always said they couldn't beat him and he ain't shit. He's a dosser and everybody else, especially in his hometown of the U.S. footprint, they say Deontay Wilder lacks boxing fundamentals and skills. And he's a trash ass fighter and he can't goddamn fight and they wish he was going to lose against Tyson Fury. Why would freaking Tyson Fury want to undertake and source the assistance of a coach that you didn't even respect the fighter that he was teaching to begin with. What what the fuck is going on? Am I am I am I missing something? Why would you want to do that? There's no way you can want Breland. You already defeated Deontay Wilder. It's nothing you can learn with Breland. And if Breland, you know, Breland is smart, Olympian, former world champion. He's not gonna go over there and sell his soul out. You know, to Tyson Fury, I would assume he's not going to go over there and do that shit. No money in the world, because when they jettison, when, I mean, when, when they sit up here and discard him and treat him like he was nothing, he's not going to be able to run back to his people. That's one thing about black people. Like, if, if he wants to do some shit like that, especially in the boxing community, people going to look at Mark Breland as being a traitor and shit. They're going to look at him as like not being trustworthy, especially a black man too in boxing. Um, it's not. It, I mean, it's a lot of black fighters in boxing, and being that I don't see Mark Breland leaving the sport of boxing anytime soon, it's going to be hard for people to trust him. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It happens in boxing all the time because money talks. But for Mark Breland, I don't see him placing himself in a position that's disloyal, even though there is a lot in the air right now as far as him throwing in the towel and everything else but man i've, I've saw other media outlets talk talking i'm not talking on it you know if, if mark breland was to get on here and, and have a conversation with me personally i'll talk on it but i'm not going out here talking just because someone told me something i'm not doing it as, as a, especially an accusation like that i'm not saying it's not true but i'm just not i'm not putting myself out on a limb like that because I know if I was to put that information, oh, oh, it should have be on fire. It'll be man, this should this should have be on fire. That's real talk. I don't have no reason to make shit up. This goddamn shit would be on fire. People be asking questions of for real. Believe me when I tell you. So let's just hope, you know, um, Jamel Heron get cleared from COVID-19. I see Eubanks Sr., Chris Eubanks Sr., man. He's talking about he know he can beat Canelo, y'all. Eubanks Jr. say he, he know he can beat Canelo. So right now, he said, I go in there to destroy. I know it's a lot of people looking at that like, I don't think that can happen. But, hey, he he been down there training with Floyd Mayweather, man. You never know. He's been in seclusion. He's been in the goddamn trenches. And he's been putting in work. They say Eubanks have been, this is boxing scene. They say Eubanks has been out of the ring since December TKO win over Matt Karabov. Canelo has been away since knocking out Sergey Kovalov at light heavyweight, allegedly. Um, Eubanks, 30 years old, believes he, 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 he's got Canelo's number when it comes to handing him his first to beat defeat since 2013 clash with Floyd Mayweather. He says, Canelo Alvarez, that's the number one fight that I want right now. Eubanks Jr. told Sky Sports, I don't think anyone on the planet would make a better opponent for him. Most guys are going in there to run and survive. I'm going in there to destroy. All right. I hear you there, Chris. All right. He said, I know I can beat him. So that's the fight I want. I definitely um, have got a strategy. I see the weakness. 
I see where he can be exposed. I'm not looking to survive. I'm taking a fight to him, and I don't think he's ready for somebody like that. He goes on to say, Gennady Golovkin and Canelo Alvarez, two of the biggest names in boxing, and they both have middleweight titles. Those are the guys I want. Those are the fights that I need at this stage of my career. I don't want to um, take backward steps. It's full steam ahead. I like what I'm hearing from um, Eubanks, for real. Um, there's all, also a WBO middleweight champion, Billy Joe Sanders, super middleweight champion. I think I said it. Billy Joe Sanders, who handed Eubanks his first career defeat back in 2014. Sanders is ongoing, Eubanks said is a fight that can and probably will happen again in the future. Everybody knows we don't get along. We don't like each other. I want the fight. The only issue is that I'm at middleweight and he's at super middleweight. And that ain't the only issue. You got to make sure you're ready to step in there with, with, with a freaking sleaze ball like Billy Joe Saunders because he's all about going in there making that fight as grimy as possible. You know what I'm saying? I mean, People give Billy Joe Saunders mad respect for – for being a fighter that goes in there and, um, you know, get the win by all means necessary. He's not a favorite of mine. You know what I'm saying? But um, I want to see Chris Eubanks go in there. I, I've been trying. I, I'm going to leave that alone. If it happens, it happens. I get back with y'all. I'm not going to put my shit out. I'm going to stick to my code. I don't put shit out here unless I'm down in the proximity Unless it's, it's been confirmed that the box is checked. So I'm, 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 believe me, I'm working on, I'm cooking on some shit, but we'll see. Um, while they keep Breland, please, Breland would teach Fury a lot about boxing if he fired. Um, he has to work. We're only hitting boxing. <clears throat> of course, Breland has. He has a lot of knowledge about boxing. Once again, it's a lot that I can't. I'm, I'm unwilling. I'm unwilling to talk about, even though I can't do it, man. But Mark Breland having having a history of boxing, who he is, I'm pretty sure he can teach Fury if it's genuinely in his heart to do so. But that'll be just so fucked up. It'll be a fucked up situation for Mark Breland to take that route to leave Wilder. And go and go in there and provide intel to the op. You don't do that. There's no way I would even believe Mark Breland would take that step to go help out the op. Period. This is serious business, people. This is very serious business. This is very serious. Deontay Wilder going back in there getting this belt. This is very serious for the heavyweight division, and it's very serious for the U.S. heavyweight presence. It's very serious because, look, little do you know that the same clowns that are over here wearing red noses and big shoes and, and, and all goddamn um, vociferous behind this damn computer screen, right? Little do they know it's going to come a point in time being that the heavyweight division is one of the primary divisions that we look forward to. It's going to come a point in time where they're talking points. It's going to say, man, I wonder when we're going to have another U.S. champion. And they're going to start going down the list. Who could be next? Can it be Jarrell Miller? Who can be next? Because we have a lot of neighboring fighters who are coming up through the ranks of heavyweight division. Now they dumbass is going to start talking about, man, I wonder when the next time we're going to see another U.S. heavyweight champion. Man, we got to get another U.S. heavyweight champion because the history. You remember when the, when the Klitschko brothers took over? They're going to start talking that bullshit, right? And then they're going to say, oh, you remember when so-and-so was heavyweight champion? Man, I missed that. But when Deontay Wilder was heavyweight champion, you're like, oh, Deontay Wilder? Man, it, he wasn't that bad after all, man. You know, he defended his title, man. He went there 11 times. You know what I'm saying? I want to. You think anybody else going to be able to come up here like Deontay Wilder did? Who else we got in this shoot? We got the, um, Jarrell Miller. Jarrell Miller don't have power like Deontay Wilder. Plus, you know he'd be ballooning up in weight. Who else is going to be in there? Who else do we have? We, we, uh, it's going to be a while before um, Gerard Anderson get the shot. You know, even though he looks promising, he looks strong. He looks promising. 
he hasn't had the experience yet to 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 get the get the title shot. It's gonna be a minute. So we have a lot of neighboring fighters that's gonna be that's right now in the ladder that's in the shoot to step up there for the future in the next twelve months. Seriously, they're gonna be working them real nice. Um. Yeah, the talking points is gonna come up on the surface. Believe me when when I tell you. Believe me when I tell you. That's why I'm I'm really hoping that Deontay go ahead and get this belt back, because if he doesn't, people are gonna say, "Oh, and then we get to you know sit up here and ride him off into the damn sunset." Right? Okay, just say that happens. Let some months go by, and then you're gonna really start to think to yourself when all the boxing. You know, you hear all these boxing platforms start to mention, like, how many champions, uh, U.S. champions do we have in the heavyweight champ, um, heavyweight division? How many do we have in the cruiserweight division? How many do we have in the light heavyweight division? How many do we have in the super middleweight division? How many do we have in the middleweight division? That's that's going to be the topic. Heavyweight, cruiserweight, light heavyweight. And then the audience is going to start coming out, you know, where are all the, the U.S. champions when it comes to the heavyweight division? Well, when we had one there, y'all didn't support it. So now we got to look deep in the pool and you have the younger fighters that's coming up and they're looking at the way y'all treated Deontay Wilder. So once they come up and they're able to reach a certain level, it's either one or two things going to happen. They're going to be very open to talk with the fans or they're not going to give you the time of day because they're going to say, man, I kind of, I kind of appreciated Deontay Wilder being a heavyweight champ. So therefore I don't appreciate the way y'all treated him when he was in here defending this title for over five years. The only one that came behind Deontay Wilder was Gary Russell Jr. As a WBC title holder. It's fact. It's the topic of this discussion. If Deontay Wilder doesn't get his belt back, just let some, you know, let several months go by and you're going to say, damn, who's next in the shoe? Uh, how can this happen? If Joshua holds on to these belts for a, 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 quite a bit of time and, and him and Fury does link up for a unification fight, it's going to be bad either way. Fury is not American. And Joshua may be half white, half Nigerian, but he he, he got them compete beneath the, the, the nation's umbra of the, the UK colors. He's not competing under the, um, the United States of America cover, colors. So who's going to be next in line to, to become a champion in the heavyweight division? Since we were so quick to kind of want to get away of Deontay Wilder, who's going to be next in line? Because if y'all true media guys and y'all over here in America, in the U.S. of A., you know what I'm saying? Y'all want to sit up here and be mad about the protests that's going on. Why the fuck are y'all sitting up here being anti-Wilder fans if you're sitting up here protesting the shit that's going outside in society? It makes no motherfucking sense. Don't talk about Black Lives Matter when shit, BBM, black boxes matter. <laughs> the fuck y'all talking about, man? Y'all sitting up here talking about uh, Black Lives Matter, but black boxes doesn't matter? Man, y'all y'all sound stupid as hell, man. Don't sit up here and, and, and try to congregate and, and somehow, oh, we, we unifying as one. But yet, before the COVID-19 hit and before all the riots and looting happened, y'all up here talking about the man was freaking classless. He won shit. He's the worst heavyweight champion. He don't have no skills or anything. But now all of a sudden we're supposed to unify. What about BBM? Black boxers matter. Does that, does, does the Terrence Crawfords and Deontay Wilders matter? You know what I'm saying? Does the Arrow Spencers matter? I, I don't, I don't know, man. But I know y'all treated my y'all treated my man like shit. Y'all booed him twice. Y'all booed him in the Staples Center in a big match, and y'all booed him in the MGM Grand in a big match. But y'all cheered him when he fought Luis Ortiz. Y'all cheered him when he fought Bermain Stavern. 
Y'all cheered when he fought Jared Washington. Y'all cheered the man. Y'all cheered him when he knocked out Dominique Brazil in two minutes and 16, 17 um, seconds. Y'all cheered the shit out of him. I mean, the place was goddamn, a, 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 a man, chaotic. Everybody in there was up on their feet, man. They was like, oh, man, God damn. When he hit freaking Dominique Brazil, it was just like somebody dunked. You know, LeBron dunking on MJ or something. People was cheering all over the place. So I knew it was people here in the U.S. that know who Deontay Wilder is. I knew. I was actually there. I've, I've heard it with my own ears. So when he stepped in there against a Brit like Tyson Fury, all of a sudden y'all can't cheer. Y'all need to work on that. Turn up and tune in to World Combat Sports. I'll be back. Salute.